Reporting in progress. Good evening. We will be calling the April 9th, 2024 Town Council Committee of the Whole regular meeting agenda to order. It is 6.34 and present are all councillors except for Councillor Merritt and Councillor Parker. We have Councillor Gajewski online. Is his connection good? Can he get on as a participant? Okay, thank you. Okay, up next is calendar and communications. Councillor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. Uh, First, I just want to say that I've received a lot of communication from folks from SP Butler and other surrounding park, park properties, folks concerned about the apartment complex in Quantic Bridge, as well as other developments and concerns, concerns about open space and conservation and um, trimming of trees down by Dairy Queen. Um, uh, I did speak to John Burke, the person um, asked me to not name who they were. Uh, they were concerned about a possible uh, tent in the woods that maybe someone was seeking shelter in, so I did pass that information forward. It was right on the city and town line, so I was not sure. John Burke said he would handle that. Um, I also want to apologize for my absence for uh, just being virtual during budget season. It is that time of year where we're finalizing colleges for my son. Um, so we've been away um, up in Maine, um, excited and proud of him, of course, but torn because I have responsibility here. So uh, definitely zoomed in more than I usually do to try to make, be one person in 50 different places. So, um, but definitely successful and was happy to be up in Maine looking at, um, he, he did get accepted to 12 different schools, looking at engineering, um, looking at possibly Maine Maritime. So, uh, very excited about that. Um, zooming in is a bit tough. Uh, especially when you're in the middle of Cassidy, Maine, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, reception is not the best. Uh, I even drove in the middle of Maine trying to find reception in another area. So um, those are most of the reports that I've received. Um, also some concerns about some of the breakout sessions about economic development and different things that are happening. Uh, some folks said like today, the one at four was too early. People work till five. Um, and that's a few letters from folks living in and around Ivy, Ivy Court as well. Um, and that's all that I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pacino. Ditto. Okay. okay. No, I don't have anything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rusk. Um, I also received um, various emails and communications from residents um, regarding the school reuse. Um, including S.P. Butler, Groton Heights, and um, Pleasant Valley. Um, I spoke with some residents at Ivy Court um, regarding their concerns, received some emails regarding that, um, and I wanted to say thank you to Councilor Pacino, who just stepped away, um, for organizing a really nice tour for us on the um, Bark Eagle, and um, it was a great time, and so thank you to him. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I also received the same emails and communications that other councillors received. And also a similar thank you to Councillor Pacino for a great tour. And thank you to our Coast Guard for an excellent tour of the Eagle. So that's all for the moment. Thank you. Councillor McBride. Thank you. Uh, various communications, <coughs> as others have mentioned, I received more so in regards to budgets and the RFPs. Uh, also received an email communication regarding additional funds that are coming to that are potentially coming to municipalities as part of the, the budget review process. I think many people saw the article in the paper about the Mohegan Pequot Fund uh, potentially being increased, which would help the town's coffers and can pick up some more money there. Uh, but the email I received also indicated that there should there there will likely be additional funds coming for ECS and other education grants. So hopefully that. Councilor McBride, I'm sorry, so sorry to interrupt you, but there's a problem with the transmission. So I think we're gonna take a break and maybe start this, you know, take a recess and we will come back and maybe begin again. So. Recording stopped. Sorry, everybody. Sorry. Sorry, Davis. Okay. Well, he said a little, Dan, can you still hear okay on Zoom? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, and this portion of 
if you don't sit, it'll be easier. Yeah, I, I'm having some medical stuff, so I need to stand. So I will do the best I can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, though, for the okay. Okay. I'll move it accordingly. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. I just got a message that people are hearing it now. Okay, so we can start again. Okay. Okay, so we're going right now. All right, thank you. So it is 6:40. And I believe we were having some type of transmission issue, so we are going to s sort of start again. Councilor Bordelon, you want to? Yep. Give uh, us so again, I just received many communications regarding SP Butler, um, Pleasant Valley, um, different properties, and some of the ones that are on here. Concerns from neighbors uh, regarding the facts. I can add some more stuff now the facts that they do not feel that they're being brought in early or involved in the process on these neighborhood uh, properties and developments. Um, I indicated uh, before that I did speak to John Burke. I, a, a community member uh, stated that they saw some type of possible building structure, let it be a tent or something in the woods and making sure folks that maybe needed some help would get the help that they need. Um, I did give that to John Burt. It was on the city town line, and so he was looking into that. Um, I also received a lot of letters from Ivy Court, um, concerns from folks still in Brantford Manor with some concerns of living conditions there. Um, people concerned about the open space. Um, it's been said many times. Uh, I guess a community member was concerned that someone from the EDC, uh, Boris, had come and spoke about um, making sure that there's a public hearing first for open space. People were concerned about what that meant. I asked them to reach out to the town manager. Um, and I also stated that I had been virtual a lot um, during the budget due to the fact of my parent obligation and trying to split myself between town council uh, and here, uh, that we were up on college tours and finalizations of picking schools. And I was in a small town called Castine, Maine, where there was very little reception. So I actually drove to a little parking lot on the college campus and was zooming in from time to time. So I just want to uh, apologize that uh, if the communications were hard to come through, um, but it was you know, definitely uh, important to be present as I could. Um, and I think those are my, most of my communications. Oh, uh, concerns about the budget, concerns about uh, the Board of Ed budget as well. Um, and Questions about the trees being chopped down. I know we asked the town manager, he wasn't sure at the time, across from Dairy Queen. Um, and that is all I have for now. Thank you. Oh, and respectfully, um, I, as many know, and I'm open about it, I'm a cancer survivor, and um, long travel for me does affect my joints as I'm on a lot of meds. And after working 40 hours a week sitting after a drive, Sometimes I just need to stand. I've been sitting, you know, and today's one of those days. So I ask for your graces and respect that I do need to stand uh, tonight a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Pacino. I have gotten uh, most of, if not all of, the same communications you folks have gotten through, via email, and I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Thank Councilor you. Rusk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I also received various emails from um, residents regarding Groton Heights, Colonel Ledger, Pleasant Valley, um, Ivy Courts, um, spoken with a number of residents, um, was able to attend a brief meeting with the Ivy Court residents um, and their concerns um, prior to a budget meeting. Um, additionally, I wanted to say thank you to um, Councilor Pacino and the Coast Guard Academy um, for a wonderful tour on the Eagle on Sunday. Um, with a number of other counselors. Um, and that is it. Thank you. 
Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I also have received the similar emails and communications as other councillors, and also a thank you to Councillor Pacino for the excellent tour on the on the Eagle, and a big thank you to the Coast Guard for how generous they were and letting us walk up and down and all over that boat. Thank you. Councillor McBride. Thank you. Um, as mentioned previously, I received the same email and correspondence from, as the other councillors received, my, most of my emails and discussions were focused on the budgets and the RFP process. I also received email communication about additional dollars coming to municipal, potential additional funding coming to municipalities for the Mohegan Pequot Fund, and I think many people read the paper today. But also an email I received talked about additional funding for ECS and, and educational funds. And I'm hoping we can get some formal uh, correspondence or guidance on that before we finish up the budget because that may help in some of the discussions we're having if we can increase revenue from the Mohegan Peacock Fund and increase revenue for the schools. Thank you. Uh, two, two more, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Have, I'm so sorry. I'm still breathing issues. <laughs> uh, tomorrow I'll be attending the uh, SCARA board as a meeting as the Groton SCARA uh, Southeast Connecticut Resource Recovery Act um, board meeting as the Groton Council liaison. And then this Friday I'll be attending the CCM Legislative Committee meeting where hopefully I can provide some updates to what I spoke about earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Gajewski. Is he on? Do we lose him? Looks like we lost him. I'll take okay. out for him to come back. All right. Um, so as of this evening, we began the meeting at 6.34 p.m. for the record, and we were having technical difficulties. Um, Councillor Parker and Councillor Merritt are absent, and on Zoom is, was Councillor Gajewski, and he should be hopefully coming back very soon. Um, we do have six councillors present for a quorum. And um, I also had many communications, as many of uh, my fellow councillors have stated, um, vacant property, um, discussions with residents regarding notices to leave their residence. Um, also budget, thank you for the tour on the Eagle and setting that up, it was much appreciated. Um, then there was, um, I had also spoken to Mr. Burt this week about, um, we've had some discussions on how the town can help assist those in neighborhoods that have been given notices to leave their residence and um, some po potential um, communications with our uh, community on maybe um, how residents who are living in apartments can deal with some of these issues and potentially um, organize a bit. Um, so with that, I don't see Councillor Gajewski online, so we will just move forward. Um, approval of minutes. Council McBride, do you want to read it all tonight? I'll read lightly. You're going to read lightly? How about... I'll start the special stuff, <clears throat> if that's okay. You want to do the minutes, or are you good? I'm good. Okay. okay. Councilor Jones. A motion to approve the Committee of the Whole meeting minutes of March 26, 2024. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, moved by Jones, seconded by Pacino. All right. Is there any communication over minutes? I don't see any, so we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. So that passes six to zero to zero. We're on to new business, number 2024-332, Blight Ordinance Revisions, and that begins on page 10 in our packet. Um, Councilor Rusk, would you like to read the motion? Yes, the motion to recommend a resolution to schedule a public hearing on June 4, 2024 for revision to the Blight Ordinance. Second. So moved. Moved by Russ, seconded by Bordelon. Good evening. Would you like to introduce yourselves and give us a synopsis? Sure. Uh, good evening. John Reiner, Director of Planning and Development Services, with me here today. Tom Zanarini, Code Enforcement Officer. And uh, also on uh, Zoom is Rich Cody, the town's attorney. So, uh, good evening. 
A uh, couple months back, we came before the council to talk about some changes to the state law as it dealt with blight, and we got some feedback from the council to move forward with updating our blight ordinance consistent with those changes to state law. Um, that drafted before you tonight. Uh, we can certainly talk through some of the specifics of that. I think Rich was prepared to go through some of those changes, and if you want us to move forward with that, we could schedule a public hearing, um, which really would be um, probably held in uh, what the, the June council meeting. Okay, thank you. Do you have any comments from councilors? Okay, I guess nobody has anything, any comments. So I am good with setting forward a public hearing on June 4th to hear from our community on what they think about this policy. And um, we should take a vote. Um, Council Borderland? Yeah, um, there are some concerns with it as a whole. Um, I do think that, you know, I, I respect the fact that the state has made revisions, but just because the state makes revisions, does not mean that you know it's applicable to each town or that you have to uh, in, enforce all of that. Is that correct? We can choose and pick and uh, select what we want. Is that correct? That's correct. As far as enforcement goes, it's it's more of a tool in the belt that might not ever be used, but right. it's something at our disposal. So do we have the man and woman power to enforce these new laws that are being presented <clears throat> here that you guys are choosing to put in? And what would that look like? <clears throat> Or we would have to hire somebody else. So right now, Tom does the majority of our blight enforcement. Um, I don't think any new uh, additional work will really be created as part of this. Really, it gives us some additional tools, if anything, to speed up uh, some of the enforcement actions for um, maybe some of the, the repeat offenses or things that don't end up coming into compliance. I guess to the town attorney, if you could speak to page 14, the two red. Um, if you could give me some of the legal background and your opinion on such changes. Um, I'm not sure what, uh, when you say page 14, which... Um, of our packet, it would be, let me count it out for you, page it's one, two, three, section three stage. page four, page four of the, of the ordinance. Section C. <clears throat> I'm five, looking five, at... Five, five, I'm looking at C, basically the red changes there. Just five C. I'm sorry, is it uh, subsection six? Five. Or? It's five. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah, this the changes here in the first paragraph of C just simply bring the, uh, the ordinance into um, into parity with new legislation. Um, I, what I did is I clarified the section that allows a lien to be placed because there's a procedure like that that has required to be done. It's not 7 148 AA, it's 49 72B. And the red paragraph um, is, is structured in order to, um, to bring the ordinance into more to align with a governmental officer. Um, investigating a particular piece of property um, is subject to the restrictions of the Fourth Amendment and what this does is it just requires consent for the acquisition of consent. And there, is, there are cases that allow an enforcement officer like a zoning enforcement officer or a white enforcement officer to seek uh, judicial intervention in the event that consent, consent is refused or access is refused. So I just wanted to um, immunize the uh, enforcement officers with that paragraph. Uh, subsection E of C is something that the statute requires, and uh, so we wanted to add it in that lien holders have to be given notice of the, uh, of the orders. Um, my other question is on E of the same section. Um, should it be a certified mail receipt? in there versus it doesn't really specify um, with you know uh, receipt and certification so it's a certified piece of mail with I saw that written in some other types of uh, different languages around the statute doesn't require it uh, usually what we do is we 
put a CC at the bottom of the of the of the letter and uh, mail it out. It could be done by certified mail, but oftentimes certified mail is, is not is not uh, signed for. And so, what we do with uh, certified mailings like to the owner is we when they're not picked up, sometimes it's hard to prove in court that they actually received it. So we send a certified mail with a copy by regular mail to the same person and we can explain to the court that, well, um, the certified mail wasn't signed for, but the, the regular mail never came back and the court would then be satisfied that notice was was given. So um, so I really recommend that we just stay with what the, uh, what the statute requires, which is that it just be mailed. And is there any reason why we couldn't make an amendment to have it certified? It wouldn't change anything. It would actually be much more open and transparent and could have even more of a standing from my understanding. Um, I don't know about transparency. I'm not sure why a certified mail would be more transparent than regular mail. But uh, you can certainly add that in, yes. You'd actually have a receipt saying you sent something. It, that, well, you can do that by mailing too. Yeah. There's a question of evidence. Um, also, on page 17 of our packet, section 7, um, looks like, wait, section 8, uh, letter D, if you could explain how that change will affect. Section B, sorry. It's 9. That's section 9B? Um, oh, yeah, it's 9, it changes 9, Bob. So, yeah, 9B. Yeah, that talks about the receiver. Section 8 169 AA was amended to provide for the appointment of the receiver by the court upon a, uh, a showing a variety of different factors. Um, it's usually done for commercial properties, not residential properties, uh, because residential properties don't generate an income to pay a receiver. So, um, so rather than recite and repeat all of the statute in, in, in the ordinance, which would take about three pages, um, we just put in a paragraph that said that the, in consultation with the town manager, the enforcement officer, the receiver, the reason we wanted to do it in consultation with the town manager was because uh, the town manager would be more and more aware of what the purse strings were like to be able to afford a receiver if the money needed to be paid. And then my last question is, um, say this passed and got enforced, um, how would you enforce it if you already have repeat offenders that they would be kind of grandfathered in, I would think, right? In the sense that you couldn't enact this uh, new thing. You couldn't count the previous months. You'd have to count the six month ticker from the start of the new enforcement. Is that correct? Uh, well, we would, we, would, we would treat it as having been enforced and with the ordinance to see if we needed to, to redo something. But um, I'm, I'm not concerned that there's any grandfathering here. There's a violation of the ordinance. So we would still be able to enforce it. So I didn't hear to understand the first part. So say my property was being blighted and it's been like that for a year. Under this new thing though, you'd have to start that six month ticker from that time. Is that correct? Well, when you say six month ticker, what? Well, in here you state months? that after you give notice for six months and no, you know, the time frames that are in this new statute would have to start fresh from that time. I don't believe you have to restart it. You would not have to. Right. So we could say that you should, right, in, in a change in this if we chose. It, it, it's a matter of important discussion, yes, you could do that. Yeah, okay. I mean, I guess I have a couple concerns. I think it should be certified mail, and I do think that moving forward, you know, when you're changing something drastically, I think the person should start from the six-month process or whatever it is that states here. It shouldn't go back. So um, I'll take my second turn in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments? Councilor Rusk. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, while it was brought up, I know you explained receiver before. Can you please re-explain that? I think, John, you explained it last time. Um, I think Rich will sure. dive into that, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Um, a receiver is, is appointed judicially by the court in order to manage a piece of property uh, mm. after the showing of certain uh, statutory requirements. Like in this case, that there were efforts made to contact the owner and, and uh, get the owner to comply. So what, what happens is you file basically you file a lawsuit in court that seeks an order to appoint a person who's called a receiver to 
to manage the property for purposes of bringing it into compliance with the code. And the court, as part of the order of uh, order, order allowing the receiver, usually would say that the receiver is entitled to compensation and you try to get that generated from the property and not from the public purse. So uh, that, that's why receivers are really sought when there's, uh, when there's commercial property that's generated an income. They're very rarely sought or very rarely granted, but the authority is given by, this, by the legislation to do it. So we figure you may as well have that authority if the opportunity arises where you can do it and it makes sense to do so. Thank you. That makes, I'm, I apologize for not Googling that again. I know there was an explanation and I just couldn't remember it. Um, can you please go over six um, penalty for violation? It's a little bit confusing um, and I just want to make sure I understand it. So it says violations of this section shall be punishable by a civil penalty no less than $10 and no more than $150 each day, but then it goes on to more and higher numbers. So can you explain how that works? Um, yes. Um, this is straight out of the statute. It's not my beautiful language. Um, but uh, if it's what, what I think is it's, it's just putting together a, uh, a tiered uh, scheme for, for fines. So if it's um, if the violation occurs at an occupied property, which is if somebody's there, it's not more than $250 each day that the violation continues. So if, if each day is a separate violation, and then if it's vacant property, not more than 1,000 for each day of violation continues. You'll notice that the, the, the paragraph below it that's all red or uh, colored is, is added in, defines what a violation means. And uh, it's basically a rolling, three, three violations within a rolling period of uh, the year. Those so are three. What, what the legislature did with this, with this particular statute is that um, it's really protecting the property owners. <coughs> I'm sorry. I didn't know if somebody said something. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, um, what it's really doing is it's protecting the property owner from from, from a really aggressive enforcement scheme. So if they come into compliance during that period of time with one of the uh, one of the violations, then the 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 the, uh, the three more conditions begin to roll over again. Okay. I don't, um, I don't know if that satisfactorily answers you. No, that helps. Thank you. Um, and then my last question: um, there was. And I'm sorry, I'm not finding it right now. I thought I had highlighted it. Um, there was a discussion about if you get three, um, basically, notices in a 12-month period, you have the opportunity to kind of move forward. That, that's, that's the paragraph we were just talking about. Okay. Right here. At the bottom of six. A third violation um, may also establish, yes, three or more constituting a violation existing. Thank you. Um, if you get three phone calls in two weeks, does that constitute three or is that one violation? Well, the, the phone call is not a violation. The violation is the issuance of a, of a notice by the enforcement officer. So in between the, the phone call, so the neighbor complaining about somebody on the street say, um, is, the, is the discretion of the enforcement officer to determine whether or not an actual violation exists. Okay, so one violation is one violation despite how many times you get a call about it. Okay, perfect. That's all my questions. Thank you. Council Board on. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, you know, because you can have people that are just neighbors that just are calling, but they're not validated concerns. And so those would not count against uh, the person I mean, unless there's actually a violation found, correct? Like as was stated. That's correct. Right. That's right. And um, when was this law changed with these new modifications? When did that go into effect? Um, I think October 1 of last year, John. Was it the year before? I, I think it was last year. Last year. Yeah. And, you know, I, what? how many violations are we currently working as we speak? 
Um, I don't have that number. I mean, there's 12 or 15, probably. Some minor, some bigger, but. Okay. And are you seeing an uptick is why you guys want to go more drastic? Is this what we have in place not working? I guess I want to, just because a law change doesn't mean, you know, many laws change and we haven't revised things. So what is the motivation to revise this now? What, what, it, what, what, what changes are you guys looking for? What action? Because there's a cause and effect always. It's one thing to say the state changed something, but if you don't really, if what we have has been working, then we're okay. So what is it that you guys are seeking? Why, why the change now? Uh, it could be just the unknown of, of something that happens that we haven't dealt with yet, especially with uh, having to deal with a possible commercial property where we might have to work, appointing a receiver would be more beneficial and would help the taxpayer. This also allows us to move a little faster on, we have some issues that often take years to get into compliance and this will allow us to speed that process up a little bit um, in some of those instances. I would just add that um, I get my fair number of complaints too and people do get upset with the length of time. Matter of fact, after I was at uh, Mr. Reiner's uh, event today and right afterwards someone came up to check on one of the properties that's been going on for about a year and it's, it's a slow process and people get angry that they have a neighbor that's not taking care of their property. Some people are great, but some people just do not comply. Right, and uh, where in this document does it help with, you know, there's a large number of mental health and things and for, you know, it could be an issue of that and a family may want to step in before losing the property. So sometimes it's great to be fast, but fast is not always equitable or fair. And so it's important to make sure that, you know, I can respect making things a little bit faster, but we also need to wonder why do we want to go fast and how is that going to affect? <clears throat> For example, you could have an elderly person that's suffering from dementia and a family member doesn't know that until outliers like, hey, this is a lien on a house or something, right? What, what ramifications are in here to protect people who are struggling clinically? They're not just being oppositional. And, you know, I wanted to come in and help out my grandmother and, you know, she can't and I want to take over the property so that we don't lose it as a family. How is there protections in here for that? Are you going to go to an extended family member as well? Dual notices? Because I saw those pathways that are available because you're not able to clinically diagnose at the door. You're just not able to. So how are we covering those bases and, and preventing legal action? Because, uh, and how are you making sure that person doesn't have a power of attorney? Um, working in the medical field, you know, a person presents to me, I have to make sure that all the documents are signed before they go under anesthesia because they're not able to represent themselves. So I'm just curious to where that is in here. It's, it's, it's the organic process, Counselor. The, uh, the, the legislation requires notice to be given. And uh, in my experience, dealing with a lot of flight uh, violations over the years. The notice flushes out those, those sorts of conditions like dementia, powers of attorney, you find out pretty, pretty clearly after the notice is issued. Um, and usually the enforcement discretion is then comes in and, and deals with it in, in a very kind and humane way to try to get it done and, and usually offers assistance. <clears throat> that, that's what the statutory scheme is meant to do is, is to have a, a, a human interaction between the enforcement officer and the target of the flight. Yeah. In addition, you know, one of the things, although I said this will make things faster, this will not make it speedy. I mean, this is still um, a very long process. It's still a governmental bureaucratic <clears throat> process. It's, it's not going to be fast. It will just speed things up a little bit over where they are now. And I'm sure Tom could speak to, in many of these cases, our first preference is always compliance. And in order for it to get to a real enforcement action in, in, in us moving forward through that process, there's had, there has to be a lot of non-compliance. We also work with our human services department um, and contact social services agencies. It's not just um, bringing a hammer down. There's a lot of empathy and communication that often happens with these issues. I mean, Tom's been doing this for the town for a lot of years now and has a really great approach in how he does this. Um, I, I don't know if there's one you want to. Yeah, um, specifically to, to answer your question, I, I have one right now where the, the gentleman we believe we've been trying to find, and I've been working with human services, I, we believe he's in intensive care and his property is blighted and it, it's there's a bunch of trash everywhere. But right now we're just not concerned with finding this person because he's in a, it's a 
serious concern that uh, he might not be do well. So it, we tap the brakes on that. Let it, let it play out. If we can get someone, if someone contacts us, maybe send a, la a letter every you know, three months. What it be? Is someone available? Is this or that? Does the green card get returned? Does, it, does the whole letter get sent back? And just, it's like they said, it's the human interaction <coughs> part that we can pump the brakes and we don't have to speed the process along. And after 30 days, we don't have to go to the next process. We can see what happens uh, in the real world. And I'd also add, this is just one ordinance out of many things we enforce, so we take much that same approach with all of them, so. Well, that's good to hear, because, uh, you know, life happens, and at any point, a single person could be hospitalized, and their grass can grow because they're in a rehab center for six months, and um, so should it be written in here? Should, you know, find that clinical medical, you know, that we, we do a temporary hold until the person's released? Uh, it, this was more based on the, the land itself and not the people, so I don't that would be more of a rich question, but I think that's where the, just where we come in as, as the officers that can. Right, because we're talking about someone's home, right? Absolutely. Right now, where, where people are losing homes and, and homes are very important, so. Right. Which um, is, and there could have someone that's not clinically diagnosed, so there is no power of attorney yet because they haven't been, <clears> so <throat> there might need to be a huge pump on the brakes because the family's trying to work through uh, you know, the situation. So yeah. that's my question. But. It's happened and, and we work with them. Like John said, we work towards compliance, number Perfect. one. It's not about finding people. It's about getting the property cleaned up and, you know, and helping the people and keeping them there. Well, thank you for answering those questions. I just like that. I think of it as sort of a win-win because we do have some resources we could provide to these people. And so explain the law to them. We get properties cleaned up and they get help getting their properties cleaned up. So. I just have one Councilor point of inf information, if I may. Your question? Um, to the town uh, manager, should we write in there that we set aside that money to help with dumpsters and all that other stuff? Or where, where would one know that that stuff is available? Should that be in here as a resource until funds run out? <clears throat> I don't. I mean, things, ordinances take a long time to change. Policies are easy to change and that. Right now, you know, you could beef it up, you could do different things, and you have to go through a four to six month process to change this. So I, I think you keep to the law in this, and then you keep your policies constantly updated. Yeah, we have a brochure that speaks to the blight process. That's where we talk about things like funding, social services, human services, and other um, avenues and, and resources that are available. <coughs> that doesn't belong in an ordinance. That's fine. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Councilor Gajewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you all for coming. My first question is, how many cases of blight have we had in the past year, per se, in a range? Um, I've had uh, around, give or take, 15 plus or more. Some get uh, resolved right away, some are ongoing. Um, and of the ones that are ongoing, um, how many are, let's say, reluctant to clean up or no, just need help with service. Um, I have unanswered, maybe th we'll go with three, I think, right now that have been ongoing. They're probably going to go to the court process right now. And those are mostly due to just they're unanswered, so I can't make a judgment. I go by the properties. There's people living there, receiving the mail, serve, serve them with, by the marshals, so I know they've received it. No contact, so they, you know, we have no choice at that point sometimes to go forward. I have other ones where... I just spoke with them. We're working with human services, uh, delaying the process <coughs> to see if the person is even available to uh, or acknowledges or is aware that there's an issue there. So. And as the blight officer, you're aware of all the services the town offer to help people clean up their blight, correct? Uh, I am aware of working with human services. We have the dumpster. I work with Public Works to, to provide that. So, yep. And, um, the going to court and um, putting the property in uh, receivership, that's a last resort, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And you only really do that if you, um, if you desperately like need to, like this has been going on a year and you just have had no contact, no nothing, and you just, you have no other options, correct? Correct. Okay. And I just, the only reason I'm asking that is I just want to make sure, I have full faith in your ability to do your job, and I just want to make sure um, that the public at home know that our town staff does an excellent job at their job, and they know um, 
they are here to help people and not um, uh, prevent people in such a way. Um, I have no real major concerns with the ordinance. I thank Attorney Co Cody um, for uh, writing a document, and I'll be in favor of the changes. Thank you. Uh, point of information. Okay. Your question? Um, so this is just moving the vote tonight. It's just to move it over to a public hearing. It's not voting on the document tonight, right? Correct. All right. So there could be people at home that want to make changes that still can. Correct. Thank you. Um, so how many people have actually lost their homes in Groton to blight? Like how many homes have we taken away from a resident? None. Not None. since my tenure. Okay. I just want to make that very clear because I know some people very recently have been new turning, tuning into our meetings and some of the things that are being said, they're taking it very literally. And when you talk about taking somebody's home because of blight, they probably could be very fearful from this. So I just want to make it very clear that this has not happened. This is not something, we're not taking people's homes because of blight. No, the, the two most extreme cases I've had was one in uh, Mill Lake. <coughs> uh, very one, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. One was in No Lake, it was a very overgrown property that um, after I finally uh, issued multiple orders, served uh, the person with the marshal service posted the property that we were going to do the cleanup uh, 48 hours before the date uh, they got in touch with me and got their own crew and cleaned it up themselves um, another one uh, the property was actually in foreclosure so we did hire a company to go in and clean it up and the uh, the bank paid us back immediately okay thank you i am absolutely in favor of having a public hearing on june 4th and look forward to our community if they'd like to come out and speak on that um we shall take a vote so on 2024-332, Blight Ordinance Revisions, we are setting a public hearing date on June 4th, 2024 for revisions of the Blight Ordinance. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? I'm also in favor, so that passes three, seven to zero to zero. Uh, point of information? Up, up. Yes. Um, to the town manager, when will this be posted? Well, the planning department will work with the clerk's office on the posting okay. uh, for for these ordinances. There's, I know there's particular uh, parameters that I think it's in our actual uh, town uh, charter on posting for ordinances. Okay, and will it also be posted on like Facebook and your our, our yes. social media pages? Yes. Thank you. And go ahead and put it on our web, main website too. Thanks. Up next, two zero two four dash three three four review of select town council priorities. <coughs> And we have Mr. Reiner here to, oh, thanks. and Mr. Off, John. Sure. Burt to have a discussion on this one. I apologize, my, my, I've got a bit of a threat, a scratchy throat. <laughs> so okay. I'll try my best. Let me just get to the page. We're on page 18. Okay, okay. as you're aware, we uh, have later on in the agenda, we're looking at Pleasant Valley and, uh, and Groton Heights for potential, moving on to the next stage of sales. Um, one thing I wanted to do is touch base with the council as we get it. Of course, as you know, we have a newer policy. Um, these are, uh, we just started a few months ago. So just kind of want to refresh people's memories on how the property evaluate, how that whole property sale process works, because we get a lot of questions from the public on that. So I wanted to remind people, go over a couple of your previous goals, priorities, um, prior to going into the further discussions and uh, and just make sure we're all on the same page and make sure we treat each property uh, fairly equally. So uh, going over the town owned uh, property uh, evaluation process uh, starts with me forming the, uh, say there's an interest in selling or selling, using whatever a property, town owned property. We, f I formed the TOPE committee, town, town owned property evaluation committee. Um, that's step one, by the way, it was about 15 steps, and uh, Bruce Jones did some, and Dan did some good work putting together kind of a concise uh, document that we'll get out there. Um, as that TOPE committee uh, convenes, they review each property before them. They check on things like, is it being used by the town currently? Does the property support uh, municipal function? Um, 
Is there a current or future use for any town department? Is it suitable for active recreation or open space purposes? So we first want to make sure, see if there's a really overriding good public use for that property. Um, is it suitable for roads or drainage improvements? Uh, will economic development opportunities be generated by sale of the property? Is the town relieved of liabilities and our cost of keeping up the property? As you know, uh, some properties we, we do keep up utilities on and that does have a cost to it, as well as cleaning up their broken windows, that kind of thing. Um, moving on from the, at that kind of, um, at the same time as step three, but it's really uh, concurrent. The town attorney, one of the town attorneys reviews uh, that property legal issues with the, um, that could prevent the sale, looking at the title, look at the appra uh, appraisal, uh, title search, like I said, phase one environmental. So we we get all that information, work with the town attorneys, uh, the TOPE looks, the TOPE committee looks at all the information to see if there's any restrictions, anything that would guide or prevent certain uses. Um, eventually, the, the committee would make a recommendation to the town council. The town council would hold a public hearing, and that's where we just passed on the two properties tonight and go moving into uh, six. Council makes a, dis a, a preliminary decision on disposition of the property. So th that's where we're at in the two tonight. Now, the only other one we even have started at all is SB Butler, but that's still a step two. So out of 15 steps, that's really early in the process of, of looking at. Uh, moving on, let's say the answer is yes tonight to move to Moving on to the RFP stage, we would send a required, legal required 824 referral to the Planning Zoning Commission to get their um, input approval on the on selling, potentially selling, or whatever else use of the property. The at the same time, town staff would start preparing uh, draft RFPs. We're a little ahead of the game on these two because, as you know, we've spent years on this, so uh, we had already had the earlier version done. The uh, of course, we take the draft, you know, get town council direction, even, even before, usually even, even we did that before, before we started it, we get input or else at this point, we get input on how you might want it changed. We share the draft, once it's kind of finalized, we share the draft with the PZC and RTM to get their input. Um, then we go out for RFP, the mayor forms a property sale review committee. And as, our, as requests for proposals start coming in, they are the committee that reviews everything, goes through interviews, goes through um, everything to do with potential developers. Um, eventually, when they finish their process, they would make a recommendation to the town council. Um, that would be step 10. And then you hold the official legal, before you, the town can sell any property, there's a legal public hearing required under CGS 7-163E. Um, so we would publicize, I think that requires twice in the paper to be posted, and we would hold that public hearing, and that uh, you would have uh, much more detail at that point on what's happening. Following that, let's, you would make a decision on whether you want to continue on, and then we would have to go to the RTM for them to approve the possible, if it was a sale, the possible sale. And then at that stage, if they're everything lined up, the town council would uh, enter into an agreement with the developer and we would proceed with that. So that's kind of the general process. So again, we're, we're on about step five out of 15 on, on the two tonight and just a step two on SB Butler. Uh, point of information. Mm. Your question? Uh, could you just uh, send that flow sheet that sure. you just read from? It would be yep. great to have that. Yep. Yep. It would be yes. helpful. Thank you. I'll actually put it, uh, I'll have, uh, Lisa, put it with the on the website with the with the agenda. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, moving into page 19, there's just some excerpts of the Groton Affordable Housing Plan. A reminder: some of the goals at the beginning of the uh, I think it was maybe February, the Town Council set priorities goals, and some of those do potentially come into play with property sales. Um, I just part of this is just reminding you: um, one of the priorities was affordable housing, one of the high up priorities. Another was um, so affordable housing, review of open space goals, parks on the west side of town being district four. Um, so kind of moving into 19, the uh, grant affordable housing plan. And as you know, we had some discussion of affordable housing with this uh, recently, but this is just kind of remind you what the affordable housing, so the executive summary to remind you of that, of the, the uh, what's contained in it. But page 22, you have some key considerations from that plan. 
One is just touching on growth and the the large need for more housing, so a reminder of that. Number two is the affordability. Housing prices, both sales and rents, are of course uh, outpacing what most residents can afford. So this is a big issue, as you know. Um, and then we want to minimize displacement. We don't. We want to minimize things like what is potentially happening on Ivory on Ivy Court. Um, Moving into, if you look at, uh, well, interesting page on 26, leverage public land for housing production. As you know, there's very little chance for town councils to affect housing outside of their own properties. So this is an opportunity to think about what you might wanna do. Moving into 27, there's two um, uh, open space maps. And really the only purpose to those is just to kind of show the Northwest quarter of town how much less open space uh, in parks they have than the east side of town and even the southwest. Um, so it's more of a good visual to see where we're at on open space availability. Point of information. Mm -hmm. I see on the bottom of this, it says June 20th, 2018. Mm -hmm. Is there an updated one of this? <laughs> yes, the town point, also said was here, pointed that out today. Um, but generally, uh, and then there's another version, yep. that page after that uh, from, uh, but uh, that's what that came out of our that was produced in oh, okay. uh, 24, oh. but there is I, the, the the conservation commission is constantly updating. They're working on. There's a, I know there's a lot of detail that goes into the the definition of open space, so they are working on more. This is just a general. The northwest hasn't changed. Yeah, okay. it still looks yeah. like that. So, and then John, do you have anything you want to go over? No, I, I think, you know, a, a real uh, big point, we hear a lot about housing, housing need, and this is one of those opportunities when we look at excess properties for the council to have a real influence on that. You know, um, we often get questions of why don't we have more private land doing this, or why is not more happening on Route 1 in downtown Groton? We don't control those properties. We don't own them. We can't force people to de develop or redevelop. Um, we can, what we try to do as best as we can for private property is set the table. And we do that through zoning that is very uh, prescriptive and allowable for, you know, in our downtown area, mixed use development. It's there, it's allowed by right. We made the process incredibly easy. That area is an enterprise zone. That area is a tax increment financing district that people, again, would have to go through a very lengthy public process in order to utilize that tool. But we have a lot of great incentives in place and we're still seeing, um, you know, again, if, if a private property owner doesn't want to sell their property or redevelop their property, they're not going to. So what are the things that we can do as we look at some of the properties that we have? I would also say if you did have any general input, this is, as I said, kind of more of a foundation going into these individual properties. Um, you know, as the tote beats on any other properties in the future, it'd be nice to have some overriding guidance from the council too on what you're looking for right off the bat. Because you know, in a lot of these situations, we go into a blind and, you know, I think every time, I've never seen a development application that um, neighbors like. Every time people fear change, um, you know, I, I think, one of the great things of us as a species is we have an amazing ability to adapt to change, but it, it's often when it hits close to home, where we live, where we work, where we play, there's this, uh, this fear of change that often happens and we question why are things going this way? So, you know, knowing any um, foundation, as the town manager said, would certainly help us and I think would also help people to manage their expectations of you know, what is going on here? You know, just as some of the conversations that we've had about implementing the affordable housing plan um, have gotten uh, misinterpreted as we're going to be changing the zoning on certain sites and things that will now be allowed at certain sites and mixing up some of the different recommendations and combining the two. And um, it, it then creates a lot of um, confusion, I, I think, on parts of people that aren't normally super invested or knowledgeable of, of what planning is. And it, it's very easy to get confused with it. Well, thank you. Um, so let me ask you first, uh, the previous council, is this okay over there? Yeah, okay. we're just shifting I bags. Have, I, I have a lot of stuff All right. <laughs> underneath my desk. There was a, um, our previous council had applied for a grant, and in that grant, I believe it was potentially for the Pleasant Valley School, 
and it was designating part of the art, basically saying it was going to be partially affordable housing in that area if, if we got the grant, because I remember during that discussion <laughs> stating um, that they were designating part of the RFP. They were defining some of the RFP process. Yes, and that was I wanted the, to have that discussion. Where are we on that grant? We and, did not get that grant. Okay. Yeah, that was the community investment fund we had applied for um, to look at community engagement, redevelopment scenarios, and possible co costs of uh, demolition for that school. The state did not deem that property or that project shovel ready enough. Right. So in a lot of these grants that uh, these more economic development type grants, they're looking for shovel ready projects. Thank you. So um, I believe each of our school, our vacant school properties are very unique. And um, I think some areas have higher needs than others. And I would propose that this council approach these sales with um, equity in mind. And that means, at least to me, such as issues as neighborhoods um, requesting parks due to the loss of their vacant school because children would pay, play in, um, at the school, so they are losing a neighborhood park. I would suggest the council agree to use um, the proceeds from these property sales and develop a park either by purchasing land nearby, enhancing a nearby area, or carving out an area on that um, school property, a vacant school property, um, and using these proceeds to create actual parks there. Um, and I would like to, us to have a clarifying discussion um, before it goes forward so that when we do set an RFP that these are defined in the RFP. Also, this leads into the discussion of how this council will approach um, affordable housing and what are the best practices of setting affordable housing if somebody was going to apply or bid in an RFP process for potentially houses or even apartments and how would that what is the best practice because I am not in this line of business and I would look to for some type of guidance as well um, but I think there are counselors that I've heard on this on here discuss many times about um, trying to have affordable housing and maybe percentages of it or mixing um, different things into the process so how would the best practice of that be sure so um I'll start with the affordable housing and then move to some of the uh, parks uh, pieces. So right now, uh, so Groton has approximately 23.5% of our year-round housing stock is affordable. As you start diving deeper into those numbers, one of the reasons that that number is so high is all the military barracks and Belfour Beatty housing is counted towards that affordable housing number those um, units aren't necessarily being given to families that are affordable. Um, not all military families would necessarily fall within that category, but it all counts with our, within our affordable housing um, percentage. The state of Connecticut, um, their general guidance is that all municipalities have at least 10% of their year-round housing stock is affordable. And really, that's kind of the floor. That's the minimum of what we should be shooting for. But if a community has less than 10%, they are subject to um, certain expedited permits from developers where they can uh, essentially waive zoning requirements and go through a development process faster. If one were to remove the Belfour Beatty, um, just for kind of academic purposes, housing from our count, we still have about 10.4% of our, 10.8% uh, of our year-round housing stock is affordable. So that's kind of just to set the stage a little bit for what is affordable. And when we talk about affordability, there's a lot of different levels of affordable um, that we could spend a lot of time talking about, but generally, we're looking for homeowners, households to not, or you know, rental or for sale, to not be spending more than 30% of their income on how you know housing costs, rent, utilities. Kind of that, that's your benchmark. You want to be below that. If you are looking for percentages of well, you know, how much affordable housing should be in a development, 
when a developer does the process, which is uh, an 830G, um, which is that expedited process, if we had less than 10% affordable housing, they have to provide at least 25% of the total units is affordable. I think a, a good number for us would be somewhere probably anywhere between 10 to 20% of total units is affordable. I think 20, 15% is probably in the right range of where we should be. Um, often when you start going over 25%, then, you know, in, in order to have a nice mix of incomes and household types, you want to have a variety of that. If we did 100% affordable housing, then it's all affordable housing. And I mean, we have to be honest and open. There's often stigma that comes along with that. Whereas when we do um, a mix of housing types, housing costs, housing units within a development, things get integrated a lot better and it really creates a much better um, and less um, homogeneous uh, community. It's not all uh, just kind of, you know, one type, which is often what happens in, in a lot of development. So I, I think if you're looking for a percentage, you're probably, that 15 to 20% is probably the right number if you ask for my professional recommendation. I've been doing a lot of work around affordable housing probably for 20 plus years. And does that also cover like houses and apartments, or how do you, is there a distinct difference? Um, really, I, I, if you were to do it, I would do it. If you were selling property, I think as a blanket number, whether it's houses or apartments, if you, as you start working into certain types of neighborhoods, you might be able to play with those numbers a little bit differently. Um, if you're doing smaller type units, if you're doing, um, maybe more cottage style development because those inherently are going to cost a lot less. There are also ways where um, there's a lot of mechanisms that, you know, depending on the, the, the style and type. I mean, as we look at properties like uh, Pleasant Valley, that certainly lends itself much better to, uh, you know, apartment style uh, multifamily housing. When we look at Groton Heights, I think we can see some of that also within the existing building. As you look at other smaller properties or neighborhood properties, if the council would be looking at, say, a property like SB Butler or even um, Claude Chester, which I, you know, at this time is really more uh, directed towards, say, recreation uses, you might want to mix up some of those numbers depending on the style and housing types that you have. So it, it's not necessarily always a one size fits all. But I think that kind of the two that are on the table right now, Groton Heights and Pleasant Valley, again, I think that 15 to 20 percent number would, would be a good start. And, you know, I encourage people to do some research on that. Look into it. We can look at some different typologies. And that's something that we can also, as we do RFPs for each of these properties, for all of them moving forward, we always want to set a minimum of what we're looking for. And again, remember, this is often a very competitive process. So if we tell the development community where here's our minimum of what we're looking for, but if you do more, you'll get ranked higher. And these are very desirable properties. So if we say there's a minimum of 15% uh, affordable housing and you know if you can make it work at a higher number, we'd encourage that. If that's what we're looking for, then see what the developers propose to us. Uh, you know, again, you want to prescribe the minimums that you're looking for. The same goes with park space. If we're looking for um, kind of leading into the, the second part of, of what you had brought up, for example, at Pleasant Valley, if we know that we want approximately at a minimum a half acre of total land area for active recreation on that site, we can put that in the RFP that we want to, you know, there's um, in the draft currently, it states that, you know, there's a shortage of parks and rec land in this area of town. And we are looking for a developer to put something and integrate that that would be open to the entire entirety of the community within their proposal. I think that we could state, you know, minimum half acre, we're looking for a half size basketball court, uh, a tot lot and X. 
it should also be said that right now uh, parks and recreation and planning and development are working with uh, one of our consultants they're doing a deeper dive into the parks and rec needs up in the northwest section of town and we're looking to have some real recommendations from them of what else we need in that area and that's something that we'll bring to you probably in the next four to six weeks and we hope to integrate that into the uh, rfp for pleasant valley uh, specifically uh, and again, just kind of wrapping, uh, putting a little bit of a bow on that. If we set those parameters for that parks and rec space, we tell the developer what we're looking for, for them to prescribe it in their plan, they would build it. And then at the time of sale, when we went to go sell the whole property, we would hold back that piece of property. So they'd work it um, into their total proposal. And we could do this with any of our sites. They would build it out for us. We would have review of those specs. It's something that could be done a lot faster and cheaper because we're not doing it. And then at the end of um, that closing process, after they've gotten their approvals from planning and zoning, and um, as we're about to go to closing on it, we would also have part of that a subdivision of property that we would keep that park and rec space because, uh, frankly, a developer's not going to keep want to keep that because of the liability if we want to keep it open to the entirety of the public. And that way it would be integrated best into the overall design of that development as well as the neighborhood. Okay, I, think, I think that covered most of it. Yes. Them. And then how would we, um, if we wanted to, let's just say Groton Heights, like to have a park nearby because I don't know if we can actually put it on that property. It's just the way it's laid out and you might have to go through the property to get somewhere. If we would put money towards maybe enhancing a nearby um, property, that might be a park. Um, may, it doesn't have to be a playground park. It could be um, benches and flowers and things of that nature. So how would we go about that when we talk about that school specifically? Yeah, I, I think um, in those types of instances, we could look to some of our partners around there. So whether it's the city of Groton and a park space that they may have, or it could even be the Bill Memorial Library and looking to them and say, all right, is there something that they were, I know that they're planning on doing some outdoor space, um, kind of outdoor learning classroom areas. That's something that could be integrated into their site and we could use some of the proceeds from the sale of that to put into that. And then, you know, working with Parks and Rec, we could look at kind of the broader area and see, all right, what are the Parks and Rec needs there? Um, you know, how far is it to Washington Park, to other parks in that area? Is that a, a huge need? Are there other resources there? Or are there some areas around there that we want to identify um, that might be a little bit more than a short walk from there, but some other neighborhoods, you know, in that district of town that need some uh, improvement to those spaces? All right. All right. So, um Thank you very much, and I'm going to open it up to the other counselors to have a dis um, discussion, and then maybe we can try and find consensus of how we would like to move forward. Councilor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. You know, I know it, it was stated that it was council's priorities. Uh, I just want to make it very clear that the priorities is not, it's a consensus of a number of people up here, that, but it wasn't the whole council. So uh, I know the town manager spoke about the goals. That's not the goal of every counselor on here. It wasn't unanimous. It was something that was pushed forward. So it's really tough when you look at the goals, because they're constantly set as the council's goals, but they're not necessarily each counselor's individual goals that they had set forward. So I think that's very important to you know put forward. Um, also, I served in the property use committee along with Council McBride, and one of the things on there was making sure community had a stake in it, and our grot and open space conservation um, could you know help identify trees and shrubs and things that were you know watershed and have the ability before we go forward to bring the, their knowledge in. Uh, so some of this stuff was never captured and unfortunately the what we were left with, the 2021 <coughs> draft, does not have as much of the other things that were asked in there. Um, so one of the problems we had with previous development, and I shall not name them today, um, when I was on the council is, again, certain counselors wanted to push forward, certain people sat on the economic committee, not all counselors, and by the time the council got it, you had to pick and choose and dig through the stuff to know. So I'm a little concerned that it's going to be only a selected committee um, and not a chance for it to come forward with the whole council, which was in the property reuse committee document. I think if I, my vote's going to be on something, I should be a part of that process 
from day one. Not getting the opinion of a few counselors, because that's what we had before. So that is a concern for me. I'd like to draw your attention to page 26 under the leverage of public housing uh, production. It says, one important distinction to point out is strategically of leveraging of uh, uh, publicly owned land does not include permanently protected open space. And I think that is very important when looking at this. Um, I'm happy that John Reiner was uh, speaking about um, some of the stuff. If you go back, you know, I looked at some of my old notes. I guess first question, when is the last time we put out any RFPs for affordable housing? In, in what sense? We put out a Mystic Oral School. We put out a ton of things. When do we? Have, when's the last time we put a percent out to a developer? I, I'm not following your for the construction of affordable housing. Our, our fee. Such as we're talking about tonight with putting potentially, yeah. if you chose to put a component in there of the 15 to 20 percent. Oh. However, that had not been, I don't believe that was the direction of the council in the past. No. So I've been working for the town for nine and a half years. When I first started working here, um, again, the town had 23 percent of its housing stock is affordable. Um, affordable housing wasn't necessarily something that was brought to us by any previous councils, and it was we need to diversify and grow the grand list. And what can we do with these excess properties? I think the housing market has also substantially changed in the last 10 years. I just want to be clear. I was on that council, and I was one of the councilors who did speak up about wanting it. But unfortunately, I didn't have the numbers to move it forward, as we have the, the new building going up next to the Super 8 Hotel. It was a great opportunity to ask for that 20 or 25%. But again, remember, as nine councilors, the priorities may be individual, but you have to have the numbers. And it's not always there. I was, I was happy to hear you use some of the terms that I had brought up that weren't being used before about looking at our westward neighbors in California. Three years ago, I was talking about that as well, looking at mixed income housing when we put our RFPs. Again, something we didn't put out before. I'll take my second turn a little bit. So just a lot of concerns with the language here. Uh, it hasn't been done. And the oral school was a great Thank you, Council Portalon. We did not ask for that either. And we had Thank opportunities. You. Thank you. Any other counselor would like to share maybe their thoughts? Just a question for clarification. I have questions and comments on the RFPs, but it kind of delves into what you're talking about now. Are we, are we bringing this up now, or I'm just not sure when to? When we're talking about Grant Heights and Pleasant Valley, we'll go into the specifics. This is the chance that the council can try and figure out where we may want to come up with some guidelines to go forward. This will help the CHOPE committee. This will help us when we get to the RFP process with some of these schools that maybe we could find some consensus on how to move forward with equality on all the schools instead of just letting them go forward without a plan to try and have equality. Okay, I think I understand, thank you. So I guess my comments would be, I agree with what everybody's talking about here about putting stuff in the RFPs, having it be more detailed in terms of kind of what we're talking about, the number of units uh, being provided relating to the number of affordable housing units, low income housing, market rate housing, luxury housing. So I'm, what I'm thinking is, is that what we should talk about now as a group? That's kind of what you're talking about. But right, you can share what you think, and then I think we could do a consensus of counselors to feel mm -hmm. like where we are. So as we move forward, we have sort of a unified um, what those consensus of okay. which direction that you can feel the council's going. Right. Just. just Mr. Burt, you have As something? Part of that you'll want to keep in mind too, are you going to restrict it strictly to housing? As you know, we had the uh, there Mahan as a potential one that would have been nice for Grand Heights. So just something to keep in mind, you know, if you do restrict it, then that that's basically what it will be, which is mm -hmm. not all your choice. Okay, so I, I, I'm in agreement that we should come to an agreement on what those percentages should be to put it in. I also think we should provide additional detail on on the acreage and the open space matters, I think we're, we're talking about that in terms of how much open space should be, what percentage, wherever it falls. And then, um, you know, also discuss about, I, I guess my point is I don't want to restrict them too much where they don't come back, but I think in the, in the RFP or the details we're asking, they need to come back to us and tell us what percentage of the acreage is open space, what percentage is for, for a park, what, what percentage is for a recreation facility. So I, I'm not saying, I don't think I need to put a percentage on those now, but I think we need to ask the question to make sure they come back to us with those levels of details. Does that make sense? It does. I also yeah. think there's some potentially zoning laws on what 
if you build a development, how much goes into open space as well? Correct. And, and that's why, you know, when I talk about um, let's not subdivide property off now as opposed because then there still need to be an open space percentage of what's left. And that percentage is still the same. But if your goal is to have a better unified development, if we tell, you know, it, we, if we put in the RFP, so, you know, essentially the more information that you give us, if you want 20% um, of the, if housing is developed at these parcels, we want a minimum of 15% or 20%. Okay, that, that's a good thing to know. We can write that in the RFP. If, you know, we know we want half a minimum of half an acre of active play recreation on the Pleasant Valley site, okay, we can put that in the RFP and be that specific and then let the developers um, design it, let them get more creative in the location. So again, on, on all of these, we want to be specific, but I think your point, Council McBride, we don't want to get so specific that we box them in either. Yeah, I mean, I'm in agreement with making sure that the documents list all these matters, but not because it's going to be different, right? They're going to, each, each unit, each place is going to be different, whether or not we're going to retain more trees at this location or less trees, but I think it's important to say these are our, these are our goals to make sure the feedback they provide gives us the answers that we can do the RFP review. That's all. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was the right timing or not, but no, those are my thoughts. That was very good. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Reiner. So I just I have some uh, questions. I just for clarification. So you, just if I understand this, your recommendation is don't segment the property. Let the developers. Oh, let me backtrack. What is the percentage of these properties that sort of required to be open space? Is there a number? Yeah, so within the Water Resource Protection District, there's a certain percentage um, off the top of my head. I think it's about, is it 10 or 15% that has to remain in its natural state? It could be as high as 20. Sorry, I don't, um, I get too many percentages jumping around <laughs> in my head tonight, so, um, so I apologize for that. But there is a certain percentage of the total land area that has to remain you know, in a natural state. Okay, so regardless of what they did, so if we segmented the property and said we want, you know, an acre for open space, their property just basically shrunk and they have to do that 10, let's just say it's the 10 or 15% in, in their the existing piece. So your recommendation is don't specify because they have to do this anyways, see what we get. And we could always change it at that point later on if we said, make it 20 or do something like that. Is that my understanding? It, it's that right? because of that, but it's actually more from a design perspective, because if we cut out a, a square on any of these properties right now, before a development team is laid out the, their best layout, it might not fit. It might look like a sore thumb in the middle of a development and there's better ways, you know, I'm not a professional designer, I'm not an architect, I'm not a landscape architect. I, I would look to the development team to know that, for example, we want half an acre of land set aside at Pleasant Valley, and I'm just using this as an example because that's a good one to kind of uh, pick out right now, is a minimum of active recreation land. Work that into your development proposal. Okay, good. Now they can, you know, that is going to be open to, and accessible to the whole community. You're going to, uh, you developer are going to build it. And then at the end of it, it will be subdivided out and the, the land will be retained in ownership by the town to maintain. So give them the parameters. Let's just say that the 15%, just yep. say, we would like to have 15% of this carved out. You figure out where to put it, how to do it. Then we can review it and look at it from that point of view as opposed to us coming at the beginning going, we want this piece. Don't don't segment out a specific piece. Let them figure out where where it fits in the overall scheme and then we can and we're not locked in at the, when they come back with their proposal, we're not locked into that. We can work with that. No, no, because I mean if for those of you that were around or listened when we were talking about these things before, often this process is us picking a dance partner because we can find what's the best development team and we might not entirely love everything they put in their proposal. Then you, the council, can dictate, uh, you know, we don't like that building, we like this, we want more trees preserved there, uh, we want a better buffer. You can tell them to design all those things. The way we've written all these, um, once we get past the RFP process, the way we write the purchase and sales agreement is you, the council, 
get to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to their design prior to them taking it to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And if they design something that's different and get approval for something that's different from what that you approved, they either have to come back to you and explain to you why, or you tell them, you know, no sale. On to the next one. Okay. Um, if somebody buys the property from us, again, the way, you know, to kind of follow up on uh, what Mr. Burt said before about the process, we've had questions about, oh, well, the developers might not do what they told you they're going to do. It's written into the purchase and sales agreement and into the deed that if they get approval for a certain project, they then buy the property and then they don't build it, we can take that property back. So there, we keep a lot of hooks in this so that like, for example, for Triton Square, the Sealy School, if they weren't building what they got approved or there was a certain period of time that they actually had to pull a building permit, they would have been in breach of their contract and we could have, if they didn't do certain things, they've been a, a great partner to work with um, and they've been building like gangbusters up there. But again, just to kind of round that out, there's a lot of checks and a lot of uh, control that we have on this process. Does the same thing happen on the on the housing side? Are there some sort of minimum requirements for affordable housing, or that's a number that we sort of set? That would be a number that you would want to set based on what you think the need is. Um, and again, you know, I would look to our affordable housing plan for some recommendations. I would look to our housing market analysis of the types of units that we might want, because you know each of these excess properties is is in a different area of town and you know some of them are right on a main road some of them are tucked into neighborhoods we're going to want different styles of housing uh, within each of those if that's what was to be done can we in the same rfp spec housing on one side to say if you're going to give us a proposal for housing it should call up these parameters but if you're going to give us a proposal for let's i say pleasant valley light manufacturing or research and development building. Can all those exist in the same RFPs? Like depending what the developer just says, no, I'm gonna do a, a, a research facility. And I think this is a good location for it. They don't have to do housing. They can just, they could do that. They could pick and choose what if they want. If you leave that open to say, you know, we're looking for proposals um, consistent with the zoning, or I mean, in some instances, people might propose a zone change on it. That, again, that's something that you, the council will see when you get those proposals and say, nope, we, we like that or we don't like that. Uh, we think that's a difficult process. Yep, that's gonna you know work with, it, with compatibility with the neighborhood or not. So again, the RFP process is something to get ideas and visions for you to find a, a development partner that you can trust and can work with. We can, what they give you in that RFP, you can then have them change it because you think they're the best developer to work with, you like their general concept, but you want them to change things. So we can put as much of that in the RFP. You know, we don't, if you want to be prescriptive that we want only housing, we want 27% of the units is affordable, and this is the affordability thresholds, and we want, you know, 1.7 acres of recreation land. If you can be that specific, be that specific, but you don't need to be. Okay. Did you give us, I know you gave us two sort of, I'm going to say, call them boilerplate um, RFPs that we're going to talk about next. Does do these um, RFPs have sort of that zoning requirement so we know what we can like? This is the zoning that currently exists on this property, so that's what we basically look to to kind of figure out what we're going to do. So yeah. So that, um, right? unfortunately, when we loaded the RFPs into our software into Provox, it took the really nice track changes version that we had and it accepted all the changes. So the two documents that you're looking at are exactly the same when one was a document with accepted changes and the other one was we've already done RFPs for both Pleasant Valley and Groton Heights. We made a number of changes to those documents um, and based upon all the information we've been getting from you for the last three years and we took our best guess and stab at kind of gleaning, you know, pulling on that string of everything you've been talking about to lay a good foundation. You know, I think in the Pleasant Valley one, it speaks a little bit to some of the, the need of parks and rec land. That's new language that's in there from the last version, which was released. Oh, that's why we have two of each of these. Because yeah. one's the old version and one's the revised. No, version. actually the one same. was the old with track changes, but 
the software accepted it. So next time we give it to you, we'll scan it as a PDF and then ship it off. So my apologies for that. Okay. We kind of caught that after um, the package went out. Okay. Um, I think I'm good. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it, yeah. But I mean, essentially, for both of those RFPs, and we can get into you know some of the recommendations. They'll, they'll be trimmed up. They'll be trimmed up more. You know, we're looking for more guidance, but right now that was a good first step from staff of here's what we've heard here's what we think is a good start and now we want to get more feedback and direction from you to know you know we're the ones that are going to write the rfps based on your feedback okay. all right thank you councillor borderline uh thank you what percent of that 10.8 percent that you're saying is affordable housing is affordable senior housing that's my first question I don't have that broken down into affordable for uh, them. Hold on a second here. Right in front of me, I don't have those numbers um, of which is which. I, you know, so we have a total of 4,221, you know, assisted affordable units, uh, 3,727 are government assisted housing units, 107 are tenant rental agreement assistance units, 377 are single family homes with uh, CHFA or USDA mortgages, and then we have 10 other deed restricted units. Um, but uh, right now in front of me, I don't have broken down of what's age restricted and what's not. Yeah, it would be great if you could bring those numbers back. I had asked for them before when we were doing RFPs several years ago, and, I, and it's great to see the number went down to 10.8% 10, 10 before we were saying. I think that's an important number. Why? Because the folks that are reaching out for my report, Branford Manor, there are families men, women, children, mixed families, blended families. And if we only have 10.8% affordable and we're counting senior housing where young children and young families can't live, that's an important number. So it's hard to give direction today on a number or a consensus from the council when we don't know that. One of the other things that I'm worried about is, I, you know, one of the reasons we had the property reuse committee with Councilor McBride and many others is us making a decision here today where are we getting our marching orders from? If we haven't had a public hearing on these properties that are up here yet and say to them, hey, we're getting close to going to RFP, what percent, what do you guys wanna see and generate that idea? Then what am I doing up here? And I speak for myself. I'm not the sole decision maker as an elected official to determine exactly what should be there. My marching orders also come from my community. I overwhelmingly heard that we should be saving the trees, the mature trees, that's not being brought up here. Um, so I'm a little concerned. So how are we going to get that direction is my next question to, to the town manager and to you. Well, I'd Mr. start Burke. with we just had the public hearing on these two properties. That was the first step to get that input. And we advertised it. That's the process. And then also, just to all the council members, if you look at the packet in advance and see some information you want, please let us know because we certainly could have brought information with us a uh, point of information I, I, I shall say we're not necessarily looking for decisions tonight. we're just you know just starting the process yeah we, we wanted to start <laughs> the conversation and we have to start somewhere so just even the the start of hey we're thinking about affordable house and we're thinking about affordable housing percentages we need some level of direction. Otherwise, um, we're just going to keep going around in circles on this stuff. So it, it, we, we have to start somewhere. And once we have a draft of an RFP based on some, I mean, all of you get a lot of communication. You hear a lot. You're involved in a lot of public meetings. Give us something somewhere to start so we can start drafting something. And then from there, uh, I think having you know, community feedback and input. I mean, we get a lot of it too. We get a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls and questions about this stuff. Point, well, point of information, sorry. Councilor Bordelon, do you yield your time? I'm giving up, giving up my time or, or no. letting him speak. I, that doesn't make sense. I was just gonna do it, yeah. You, you would have to yield your time to Never mind let that. him speak. Sorry about that. Thank you, continue. Uh, so today, if we don't even know what percent is family affordable housing, I can't really make a decision. 
I feel the public hearing was a generic public hearing stating we were going to be possibly selling them. Now I think it starts the next phase of saying, what are the things it could be used for? When we say we don't want to carve off certain percents for open space because we want to give the developer the chance to decide, in my opinion, I speak for myself, we live here. We should be making those decisions on what we think it should be, and let's see what they come with, and we can negotiate those numbers after. But I think if we feel that a 50% or this percent needs to be open space, then that's a decision we make, and it's not something that we should worry about. Once we lose that land, we cannot get it back. The developer that takes that land and, re, and re, um, builds on it could sell it in five years, and we're working with somebody completely different. So I have a lot of concerns with this. I'm happy to hear that we're finally looking at affordable housing. Um, but I do not think this kind of platform here is going to be, when we get two chances to speak, to throw out a few ideas, um, is enough. And what about the space after it's sold, is my question. What happens to the new person who takes the land? Which space? So we sell a land and the person you know, gets this other thing. We say, we want you to keep this much space open and the new developer comes in. Are they going to be governed under that? I I'm sorry. You're talking in very broad generalities. Well, so I mean, what, Like a deed restriction? No. Is there going to be deed restrictions? Or what, what do we, because we can't restrict people once we sell it completely. Yes, we can. Once we, once we sell the land, that is then, uh, say, a certain uh, development is approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. If there are certain set-asides in that, so again, my, my recommendation would be that you set what that minimum percentage is you're looking for, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's for open space. If you want to then retain that, parks and, that park and recreation land, my recommendation would be that the town re retain ownership of that park and rec land. What happens with the remainder of the private property that the housing, the apartments are built on, that's held by a private developer? <clears throat> Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it sounds about right. And then to okay. add, like, the water resource protection, which Pleasant Valley is in that, correct? Yes. I just looked it up. It's 20% um, vegetation in a natural state. Yeah. And then we're asked tonight to, let's come up with a fair thing for all the properties. They're not all created equal. I cannot, in good faith, make a blanket plan that's going to fit all those different properties tonight, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rusk. I believe Councillor Kaniski had a point of order or point of information. I'll do it during my time. So I'll okay. Councillor Rusk. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm going to stay very broad because I know we're going to talk about each of the properties in just a moment. Um, I do agree that it is very important to use, to, to keep to put in the RFPs that we are would like to keep some park space, um, and that that be returned to the the community. Um, so, um, where that is on each property, I agree, can be decided by the developer as long as it's accessible um, by all residents. Um, and I understand that process. I, I took me a bit. I now get it. Um, but I, I agree that we need to look at what percentage of each property, maybe individually. I don't think that that is something that needs to be done as one blanket statement. Um, when it comes to affordable housing, if this is affordable, if, if they do develop housing, I do believe that 20% is a great number. Um, so I'm going to throw that in there. Um, and then I will hold more of my comments for each individual um, RFP that we're talking about. Um, thank you for the 10.8% number because I did not know that Belford Beatty was considered in there. Um, did you also say that barracks were considered affordable housing? That uh, I believe all the barracks housing is counted towards that number. Interesting. Okay. Um, that was not something I knew. So 10.8% is, is very low. Um, I know that there are a very large number of people in Groton who, who are struggling to find housing, to afford housing. Um, so I do believe that if we are going to add housing, that 20% would be a great number. Um, other than that, I will hold my comments for each individual property. Um, thank you so much for all the information. I really appreciate all your work on this. You're welcome. And just you know, one point. So again, the, the state every year puts out a list of communities that their percentages of affordable housing. And 
again, the state kind of threshold is 10%. And so the fact, do I think that's enough house, uh, affordable housing? No, I do not think it is. But that's kind of the minimum threshold so that you are or are not subject to those um, 830G type of um, very one-sided developer application. So the fact that we have met that minimum threshold, not every, there are a lot of communities in Connecticut that have not, that are not even close to it. So, I mean, it is a good point to be, but we also recognize there's a, a much greater need. Hey, can I finish? Yeah, you have time. Um, I do want to recognize that Belford Beatty is open. It's not like when I lived in military housing that it was only military families living there. Um, so it is open to other people. So, um, you know, that's kind of a soft number, I would say. Um, but I, I do think that if we are having housing developed on any of these properties that we need to look into housing that's affordable as well. Mayor. Can I just add, I, mm -hmm. I was speaking not long ago with the uh, captain of the sub base and some others, and they mentioned that they're really trying to, as leases come up, gear just towards Navy. So they seem to be heading in that direction as of recently. I know back in the day, it was it's fluctuated desperately a lot. needed. Yeah. So, um, so uh, interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilor Gajewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Quick question for, uh, we talked about uh, the watershed district. Um, so if a property is in the watershed district, say it's 10 acres, two of those acres would have to remain intact, correct? They, I don't have the uh, exact text of the zoning regulations, but basically it would have to be in, its nat in a natural state. It would have to be in a natural vegetated state. So at least two acres would be, you know, trees planted, um, et cetera. Now, would that count as somebody's backyard? That would not necessarily, for an individual house lot, I don't believe that would uh, be counted. If you looked at something like a multifamily development, you'd have to show that a certain area will always retain its natural state and that in the future, more buildings and development couldn't happen there. Normally, when we start carving off house lots to start putting conservation easements on portions of house lots, it gets really sticky. Okay, and then um, is it, if we recommended a percentage of the property that we wanted to preserve, what would be kind of a good, so say if it's five acres and it's 10%, it's half an acre saved. If it's 10 acres, it's an acre saved is that does that hurt the value of the property to be sold if we put that in an rfp the more land you want set aside as open space or park land or recreation land that certainly lowers the value of the property um, and, and that's you know there's that's one of the difficult things about this piece of property. We have so few good developable properties in town that have water, that have sewer, that have access to such a great, you know, commercial corridor, you know, in the example of like say Pleasant Valley. And if you were to preserve 75% of that property is open space, you lost a great opportunity for development. Whereas there's other properties that might be around there. And, and I kind of throw out an extreme number just as, as, as an example there. Um, you know, you want to look at what is the housing need? What can you accomplish? Um, so I, that's that kind of weighing. Um, what are, you, you know, because you kind of have two goals here. We want to address some of the parks and rec need in this portion of town. And we also want to see housing developed that, you know, affordable and mixed income housing. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, my next question is, what if a portion of land is like undevelopable? Uh, undevelopable, like what if it's um, wetland? Does that still count towards the percentage that is protected? That I believe can t count towards the 20%. I'd have to double check within the zoning regulations. And again, I mean, some of this stuff, we're really diving deep into, you know, no matter what you lay out is minimums. In addition to that, there's all the zoning minimums that will apply to this. So I, I do want people to kind of rest assured, you know, one of the things I have to bring up is we have incredibly restrictive 
and prescriptive stormwater <coughs> design standards. So when people ask about, oh, what's the impact going to be off-site for stormwater runoff? It's like our regulations, we just updated those a few years ago. Those are going to be very helpful to not impact, you know, properties off-site from stormwater runoff. And we, especially in the Water Resource Protection District, we require a lot of infiltration back into the ground as part of that. So. Okay, um, my next uh, statement, uh, more of a statement on the affordable housing, um, just for those watching at home, is um, the state of Connecticut, they did a whole, um, there's an article out there, I believe if you just type in affordable housing state of Connecticut, it has the maps of every single town. And if I'm remembering correctly, um, the state, the town of Groton ranked third in our affordable housing. Uh, we had the third most affordable housing. Now, granted, that was um, with the Balfour Beatty development counted towards that. Um, my concern, uh, Director Reiner, we said, you know, in an RFP, we're going to carve out 20%. Still with the Balfour De Beatty development, could that potentially hurt us if we did add more? Because we are at 23.5% right now, technically, in the state size. If we were to go over 25%, are we technically hurting our marketable rate to potential other developers? I, I'm not quite following. So we don't s often see a lot of new affordable housing developed. With that said, you know, we did just re uh, see a recent presentation from the um, Groton Housing Authority, and they got planning and zoning approval to build some additional affordable uh, through the Community Challenge Grant. They're going to be adding, I think, another 50 or 51 units. Um, but as far as, I mean, if we dictate on these on these sites, any of these sites that we're looking to sell, that, oh, 20% of the units need to be affordable, well, that is going to impact the value of that site. As far as in the state's eyes, I mean, when they're looking really at affordable housing from, you know, there, there are a lot of different lenses that they will look through, but um, from a percentage based, I mean, the more units we add, the better off we are. They're really looking at that 10% number and whether or not you're subject to 830G or not. That, that's really what a lot of it comes down to. Okay, um, thank you for that information. That does answer my question. Um, my next question would be, in the RFPs process, does it state the current zoning regulations? Uh, yeah, within all the RFPs will indicate that the zoning is X. And, you know, here's a link to the zoning regulations to see what the uses are. Every time we put out an RFP, we hear from uh, the development community of, hey, you know, you, we don't necessarily hear from every single person, but they usually, engineers call us all the time asking about zoning and what allowed uses are in certain design specifics if they're unsure um, about the intent of our regulations. Again, we adopted new regulations, I think it was 2018, 2019. We tried, one of the biggest focuses on those regulations was not only to give clarity and, a, you know, from an understanding, but also a clear process. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, so a developer could propose a proposal that's not within current zoning regulations and say, theoretically say if we chose that developer and the zoning regulate, we could, it, the deal would have to be contingent on planning and zoning agreed to change the regulations, correct? Correct. There may be instances where someone proposes something that is not consistent with our plan of conservation and development, that is not fall within the zoning regulations, but it might be something that you as a council see, oh, wow, that's actually a really good proposal. We think that's consistent with the area. That's something we never contemplated for that piece of property. So, and that's where, again, during the RFP process, you can give that latitude, and if you like something, that's great. If you don't, then you don't have to accept that proposal. I've seen in many communities some really great developments move forward on something that was not consistent with the municipal master plan, that was not consistent with the POCD, and they had to change that master plan. They had to change the zoning on it. Um, 
not, not in this town, but in previous places I've worked, I've had to walk a number of things through those processes that it was a, a friendly application that was something that the town encouraged that type of development process, you know, engaging the community, engaging the neighbors. But, you know, it, until someone comes forward with it, you often don't know. Um, so that would, so, um, so really you recommend the RFP be vague, very vague, so we do have that flexibility of and increase our number of proposals that the town receives. Am I understanding that correctly? I think you're vague to a point. I think you want to state the zoning is this. Um, if you have a very specific preference for something, you know, we can put it in there. But if you're looking for something a little bit more uh, or a little bit more creativity, you can, we can write anything we want in this RFP. There, there's no um, you know, law that says we can't put something in there. So if you want to have um, your affordable housing percentage, if they do a housing, you know, we can put in there. You know, we're open to proposals for housing and for other uses consistent with the zone. And then it's I, it's kind of you know up to the developer if they want to take that level of risk because responding to a proposal like any of these that we're talking about putting that project together is going to cost them tens of thousands of dollars so we want to be clear and uh, about what it is we're looking for we don't want to kind of send people off and then oh yeah you know what we we really weren't thinking about selling this and and now we went in this general direction so it would be a list of like housing retail it'd just be a, just a long list or i mean we can reference the zoning regulations but if there are things that you're specifically looking for i you know and, and i think that's where when we start getting into some of the more specific sites and um you know if in one of the more neighborhood type properties, if you wanted to dispose of those, you might say, hey, we're really looking for cottage style development. That's something we like, and we'd really like to see that with 25% affordable, and you know, we still want a neighborhood park of a minimum of, of this size. You know, That might be where you kind of do that. Um, you might get a little bit more specific or not. <laughs> Councilor McBride. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a great discussion because I think if one thing we're, we're getting involved in the details and providing you information that should help the RFP process to make sure we get it right. So I think that's great. Um, one thing I, I do want to say um, I think we should consider because we're making some changes to the RFP and I think when John Burt went through and I appreciate the detail of the 15 step process, I think there's one step that this council may want to consider adding and that would be around 9.5. Nine would be the mayor forms the RFP committee and they review the various information, yada, yada, yada. The 10 was then to make a recommendation to the council. And I think out of all the 2021 versus 2023 discussions we've had, and I don't want to beleaguer them, but I think the one thing I heard loud and clear was the community needed to be involved, not just the community, but also the public agencies. So what I'd like this council to consider when making a change to call it 9.5, where the TOPE committee presents to the community as well as all the various agencies that have impact because you were just referencing they need to get involved so why not involve them before they make the recommendation to the council so i would like the council to consider having the tote present to the community and to the various agencies the proposals as well as their recommend recommendation to the council prior to the actual recommendation of the council to have a hearing or i don't know if you call it a hearing or whatever but to get that out in the community let it be known show the proposal proposals the summary of the proposals and the recommendation that the TOPE's making. So with that being said, would you have a concern either John Renner or Tommy Andrew Burke of doing such a thing? Because I think that's the one item that I think is missing from this process. And I'm wondering if that, if, is it missing because it's, it will cause a concern or is it something that this council could consider adding to the process? So, I mean, just to mention, it's not the TOPE, it's the Mayor's Committee. Sorry. What yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to point that out, that at that point, the TOPE isn't uh, yep, the, the, the group involved anymore. You know, in some of these RFPs, there may be um, 
some information that is that you know they may have financial information or other things that are confidential one of the other things we want to be aware of is as no different than if we put out a list of um actually, i don't know how that we can engage the public at any point that we like in the process and i mean and, and that's something that the council can do so whether it's um the council reviewing all the proposals and then um you know you want there has to be some level of conversation that doesn't give one developer an unfair advantage o over another so I, I do think you just need to keep that in mind and and i don't know the best way of working that into the process but if the entire um interview process with each developer is public the person who goes last is going to have an advantage over the person who went first yeah, so that's so certainly saying that they're involved in the entire interview process i just feel and i think you've heard the past couple of years the community feels left out of these decisions and i don't know how we do it you're the experts at it but if there's a way to bifurcate or split up between the rfa committee makes the review and then the recommendation of council there's a way we can involve the public in any way you desire i think it would it would be in our best interest to do so if we could uh, oh all right um I, I think if the council were to move forward again we're just kind of talking hypotheticals and examples here when you move forward with a particular again we're looking for a dance partner we're not looking for the exact thing that they're proposing and many times somebody will come in with a proposal that you the council get to set the threshold of what that proposal is going to be somebody might propose um 10 units on a site and you say you know what we actually think 15 units is the right amount of units on that site um, or five is the right amount of units on that site and you know before we really set a threshold for what we as a council want to approve as a plan we want to have um some type of public engagement process on this and get some feedback i, I think public hearings are helpful but i think that getting the community sitting down with the developer and talking in a, in a real forum of, of back and forth. I think something like in that you could say, developer, we want you to engage with the community. We're going to be present at the meeting and we want you to present this and um, in a way that has meaningful conversation, that it does, just doesn't turn into uh, a yelling match or people just expressing um, you know, negativities, but there can actually be some real changes with what happens in the plan. That's something that could happen before the council signs an RFP, before the whole council signs off on something. But I think in order for a developer to want to do that, they're going to want some level of assurance or like, hey, all right, I, I'm the one out in front on this. And, you know, this is the developer that we like. Now, before the, the council, um, makes any recommendations of moving forward with the purchase and sales agreement, we want you to, you know, get engaged with the community and refine that design, refine that plan with their feedback and their input, and then come back to us with something else. I mean, that, that way, there's, there's probably, you know, just kind of off the cuff, I think there's some, some uh, validity to doing something along those lines if that's what you're looking for for more meaningful public engagement there i think there's some good ways of doing that okay thank you and that, that's all i think well, i'm looking for i'm sure many others are uh, and I, I know the concern is that if you involve the public i think people say it's the you know the nibby not in my backyard everybody's going to oppose it but i think as an elected official our job is to do what's best for the town and if there's a lot of opposition and if it's the right decision for the town i think we as individuals need to move forward and make the best decision so even though that process will be tough involving the community it's i think it's something we should do so those are just my thoughts Thank yeah. you. And I, again, the more information we have, the more, I think, meaningful conversation we can have with the community about <coughs> what is ending up there. Because right now, there's so many hypotheticals. We know with each one of these properties that there's some kind of big flagged items that people are concerned about. Those are things we can identify in the RFP, but we're only going to get be able to get so deep into those with the RFP. And it, the rubber's going to hit the road with these, with the actual proposals. And as you dissect those proposals and who you think can deliver the best product that is good for Groton, good for the neighborhood, good for the entirety of the community. Thanks. Thank you.
Councillor Gajewski for a second time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to put this out there real quick in case I do run out of time. Um, what I would like to see in an RFP would be young professional housing, which is a kind of a newer concept. It's housing for designated for 25 to 40 year olds, like young families. Um, I think that's important, especially with a lot of young workers coming in from EB. Obviously senior housing, as one of my colleagues previously mentioned, and mine would be 10% affordable if, we, if it were to be housing, um, just because that's the state rate. Um, my next questions are regards to the TOPE committee, uh, the TOPE, the town on property reevaluation process. Um, do we vote on the RFP? Am I understanding that correctly that we don't? No, we, we get it to your satisfaction and then we release it, but there's no, basically it's just consensus for releasing it, the final version. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then my next concern, um, I know it had been previously mentioned um, about community involvement, but if I remember from the 2023 TOPE committee doc, the TOPE uh, process document, it, the language in there made it complicated to have a quorum. Am I understanding that from the legal perspective correctly? Well, I don't think we're talking about having um, the membership for on the committee. We're talking about engaging the community and other agencies and presenting to them, getting their input. So there's a difference there. Okay. And are we potentially allowed to add community met in the current TOPE committee process? I don't believe it's in there, but is there potentially to um, add a one or two community members to the mayor's committee, or is it restricted to town staff, two counselors, and two RTM members? Right now it's prescribed. I mean, the council could update policy wherever they want. Okay. Um, I think that's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I just have some things that I would like to notate that I would like it to be very clear for any developer that if they would like a zoning change, that is on them. It is not the responsibility of town staff to get them a zoning approval. You could help them maybe understand the process, but it is not our responsibility. That is fully 100% on them. Also, I would like to note, note that historically, by leaving our um, some of our RFPs somewhat vague and open to many different options is where Thayer Mahan came in, and I don't think anybody expected that. And I we have received numerous letters by the community that in that neighborhood who said they that even today still want Thayer Mahan to build there. I mean, and that they loved that idea and that concept and they want them there. So by leaving it somewhat vague and open to different ideas, you just never know what might come in. It might just surprise you. Um, there was um, comments about reviewing the proposals publicly. For some reason, in my mind, I thought there was a legal issue with that until things are decided and something is signed that you can't just bring everybody and show them publicly because they are sometimes closed bids. Mm -hmm. So I also remember that on the state property, we could not have a public hearing and you were down to the wire trying to get assigned something with the state before we could even do a public hearing on this because you couldn't just come forward and show a per perspective. So. I don't know if we can change that wording, but I do remember that very clearly because I had asked uh, numerous questions on this about opening things up to the public on that. So I think we'll, have, we'll have to have some dialogue on that. And part of it would be we'd have to you know, have concurrence with the developer also to release information. Right, because I also was under the understanding that when the mayor s puts their committee together and they go have conversations and they do their grading and they select that this is very confidential that they're not supposed to be talking to other counselors about it they're not supposed to be talking to anybody else they're supposed to go in and do their job and they're supposed to just have this um process and they're not supposed to share it publicly because it's supposed to be like closed bids that's what i thought i don't know it, until and again we can confirm with the town attorney on this but until someone is selected yeah and then after that a lot of information can be released publicly. But selected by whom? By the council. 
Right, because what's being proposed is that after the mayor committee reviews them, that we have a public presentation of all of them. I'm like, I don't know how, because I just remember there was a lot of legal discussions about all this stuff, and maybe I'm just refreshing my memory and everybody else's, but we might want to relook at that a little before we... I'm not opposed to having dialogue publicly and presentations. I just want to make sure that we're doing it legally because I don't want to get into any legal I, issues. I know you can't review you can't reveal the others until you get through the process with the preferred. So. Right, that's what I remember. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know if that will fit having we'll, public we'll discussions. Yeah, we'll do our best to. I'd appreciate input. that. Yeah. Just look into yeah. it and and just really come back with like the right answers to our questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I've heard from counselors here. I sort of want to have like a, a very quick sort of like consensus dialogue to some of the things that I've, I've heard that um, that going forward to see that do we have some kind of consensus for these type of items. So for the type of RFP, are we open to more than housing or do we want to just stick with housing, or are we open to general, overall <coughs> vagueness? Point Councilor Borlan. Yes. Uh, are we talking about which properties? These two that are on the agenda? All just properties? in general. In yeah, general. I, that, I think every property is not the same. Okay. That's not fair to do. Councilor Pacino. Um, I'm in favor of anything that uh, produces tax revenue. Okay. So I sort of need, yeah, you, <laughs> yes, no? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And then Councillor Rusk. Um, I'll say yes, but understanding that we could to decide by each individual. Site. Absolutely, absolutely, we decide each individual mm -hmm. one. But in the general concept of things, you know how it we could be our like, starting point of developing something. You could change for that. Right, Correct. exactly, um, because there are specifics that we can talk about. Councillor Jones. This is for open more than just housing. That's yeah, do you want to have an open concept or do you want to mm -hmm. just stick to housing nope, to majority nope. of the, open. and it doesn't mean you have to stick to this for everything through, I'm yeah, sort of getting, general concept. yes, and Councilor McBride? I just need some clarification on what, what are we approving housing, I don't understand. We're not approving question. anything, we're just sort of okay. getting a consensus of where we stand on things so that they can have some kind of direction. Are we looking to have an RFP process where we just are, are sticking towards housing alone, or are we open to other ideas and keeping the RFP more generalized instead of focusing so, on specifically housing? So we're looking to create a boilerplate specifically for housing. Sort of a general direction on where the starting point, anyways. It a can starting be, point on where to you go. You can change as we get further into it. Yeah, we can get into that, more that's details. That's all we're dealing like. with right now. Could be a couple of years before we're dealing with something else, right? And we're just dealing with the two properties. It's how to develop the RFP. Yeah. Okay, I'm Point of information yes. for two properties or all properties moving forward? That was the clarifying. He just said two properties. I'm just making sure. I'm just saying in general. Oh, it's in general. On how we're doing RFPs, yes. Yeah, no, I'm okay because I, th I think it's, there's nothing else on the radar screen. So it could be a couple of years before we change this again. Councilor Gajewski. Can I give it a minute? priority of housing, but also we're open to your ideas. Bring in your creativity in a sense. So yes, openness in general to housing. I am also open to um, different ideas. So I do not want to just solely focus on housing, but um, there are specifics about housing that I would like to have discussions by putting in housing references, but um, if it comes to parks, do we agree that we can potentially put prop, a park on the property, enhance nearby property, hold, and then potentially even hold the proceeds to do park um, enhancements in certain areas? It's just basically to say, do we have a commitment to parks um, because neighborhoods are going to be losing a park. Um, Council Bordelon. Again, I'm, I'm a little unclear about what you're asking. So is this for all properties or just the in two general? Are, this is a general. So this could affect every property that comes for us in the next several months. Is that well, correct? there's basically 
How, how many empty vacant school properties? That's basically what we're talking about. So we're talking about all the vacant school properties. I'm not saying that. You are, um, I think you are taking it very literal. I think this is more in a general, so that they have a direction to begin on where to start instead of, we are not going to be able to pick apart every single property at this moment to give them a general starting point of where I to go. I just want to understand because you want a consensus and it would be all the school properties that we're working on. Um, I guess I'm torn because for me, I'm a big firm believer in open space and parks, but going and doing it in other, I'm confused at what you're asking is what I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. All right. Because that was a lot. If I heard you so correctly, you said, are you are That you we for either can put a park parks? on the property. Are you for we, going down the road and adding it to additional I'm, I'm trying to explain. So we yeah. could put it on the property. We can enhance nearby properties. We can purchase other properties. Would you like, because we are taking away vacant school properties from a neighborhood that had a park there for the, all the children in the neighborhood to play at, are you interested in having a, trying to ha facilitate a park? I That's am, basically it, in the generalized okay. terms. So I guess the generalized answer would be yes, but as far as the detail and how we get there, I'm not sure based on how that's proposed. And we're not in the because details, we're just overall general. Um, Councilor Pacino? Vague. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Councilor Rusk? Um, yes, leaning towards on that property and not purchasing property elsewhere. Um, Councilor Jones? Open to open space is a general concept on every piece of property, and however it gets happened, however it happens. Okay. Councilor McBride? I, I'd like to see the RFP state that we want them to provide their their you know we want them to consider open space parks playgrounds and recreation areas and they provide us their details back as to what that those percentages should be is that i mean i i, I think we just say open space parks playgrounds recreation areas are, are valuable to us we, we it matters to us a lot we want to make sure you understand Groton cares about that and you should submit your proposal should consider mentioning those and providing what what you're going to do right and, and let me just jump off very quickly if somebody was as i'm saying like Groton heights is a very small property it's it's very hard for the public to be able to get to maybe an area if you're going to put a park there let's just say somebody's building a development they also have an an option to purchase other property and put a park somewhere else they don't have to put it on their property is that correct i mean there are different options that go on in these type of things so I'm not trying to pin it down, so to say, but as a generalized term to say, we are supportive of trying to have parks because we, the children are losing parks. To get, I know what you're saying and, and how to word that in the RFP that, you know, essentially you're looking for the town it's very important to have parks and recreation and open space land adjacent to these sites because right now many of them serve some of that purpose the town is looking within your proposal to show um, on-site possibility of off-site improvements to adjacent parks other public lands and other creative options that would um, allow you know the surrounding vicinity access to these types of amenities I, I think something like that would give the creativity available I, I think you know in a site like Groton Heights I think that's really important I think even with Pleasant Valley one of the things that um, we were surprised to see you know we did go out to RFP on that before we did have a preferred developer who ended up um, that was never formally um, signed they never signed a dotted line i think we had a letter of intent they had an option on i think it was a 5.6 acre piece of land adjacent to the pleasant valley school that is all undeveloped land right now that could be developed they were going to put a substantial um, open space trail network and a small park within that piece of property i think we want to encourage that level of creativity so that, oh, hey, look, there's a piece next to this. We can grab it, make it part of it, and turn it into an amenity for the entirety of Groton. Thank you. Council McBride, where are you? I'm, I'm not sure. I think, I think we, just as I mentioned, we list Groton's preferences and we want them to be flexible to come back and provide solutions, knowing that we're gonna face, we're gonna focus on open space, parks, playgrounds, recreation, 
wooded areas, et cetera, et cetera. So you sound sort of like a you support parks kind of thing. Yeah, support all part of this. But I want to be okay. open, so they, they Absolutely. Provide. I'm not pinning you down okay. to any specifics. I'm just saying in general. That's all. So I don't want to speak for you. It sounds like you're saying yes. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, Councilor Gaisky. Yes to all. I do have concern about um, possibly purchasing something else in the area for a new park because you don't know what could be on the market, what's not on the market. Um, Did, I, I just want to clarify that the developer could also purchase that. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, so, um, and then, um, so similar to Council Rusk, um, preserve, uh, it, keeping part of a development if we were, were to do a development on one of the vacant properties um, because it has been the heart of that community. It has, at one point, it was the heart of that community as being at a school. So prefer to keep it on the um, current property. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think as a consensus, I think we support support parks maybe in different aspects and ways, but I think parks is a generalized um, supportive. No, I, I, I think I have good direction on the general consensus. I mean, and I hear the preference of on-site or, you know, uh, abutting adjacent. So it's something that's part of that project. I'm um, open to yeah. um, different avenues because I see some of the, the issues that could arise with some of them. So I do see I'm open to different creative ways. Okay. So, okay. Councillor Bordelon, your question? Um, when we're saying the parks, are we including like mature trees and looking at those things of limiting destruction of our forests and, and green bands? I think we're just talking parks in general and we're not getting into the specifics. So when will the other ideas of counselors come before us as a consensus? Oh, then that's when we get into each property specifically. Oh, so not, okay. So right. then we have sort of a housing, my thought is, I'm just going to throw it out there very quick and then see where the counselors stand on this. I think if somebody comes back with a bid and it's about housing, maybe we put a specific percentage on there. At this time, I'm not prepared to put a, per a, a percentage because I think I, I just need to do a little bit more homework on that and maybe even ask you if through Mr. Bird, if it's okay, if you could present some of those things that and share them with an email or something, give us some information to be able to to read, to understand exactly what would be the best and what the best practices are, if that if that is the case, if housing is comes in on a bid. Um, yeah, I, let me do a little bit more homework on that. You know, I have um, one planner; his PhD was focused on affordable housing development in suburban municipalities like Groton. So I think he could probably help me with this a little bit. And uh, another planner that is going to be starting for us in a couple of weeks. Uh, his focus uh, and his previous job has all been on housing and affordable housing. So um, I, I got some good expertise uh, at hand on that. And I'd also like some information, if it's possible, on single family homes and how do you hold that on a resale to a certain percentage that has to stay affordable if there's no HOA or some kind of authority or deed restricted? Like what I, if a developer came in and said, I just want to build some single family affordable homes? We would require it be deed restricted. So and at, then you'd have to have an HOA? No, not necessarily. No, it would be a deed restriction that goes on that single unit. So even if, for example, um, those developments I was talking before, the 830G. So if a developer did that process, 25% of the units have to be affordable. So um, if they were building, you know, 10 units, we'll round up and say three of those units and they were selling them all. At the time of purchase, whoever bought those three affordable units, there would be a permanent deed restriction on that property. Usually, um, different states do it different ways. Sometimes you'll see a 30-year deed restriction. Now, a lot of the kind of uh, the new standard is a 99-year deed restriction that resets at every time of sale. So it's deed restricted in perpetuity. <clears throat> if that's something that we were looking for for single-family homes, we would just say we want them deed restricted, affordable. Period. On single family, on single family for those particular one lots. lot, like you own your lot in your house, yep. that you have to deed restrict it, and it holds it at some kind of price restrictions based upon area median income. So it's it's not that it will always. And sell we have for. those in our community. Yes. 
We do. Yeah. Didn't know that. Yeah. Very interesting. I would like to know more information on that, please. In most privately developed affordable housing now that is for sale units, there's some type of deed restriction on. Okay. Very I, I've spent way too much time in, in past jobs <laughs> talking about that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Did not know that. I have seen affordable housing built in our community as affordable housing and there is no restrictions and when they resale, resell them, they just resell at going rates. And then sometimes when a developer gets federal money, they will have to put a 30 year deed restriction on it. So a lot of times you'll see certain um, affordable housing developments, it will be held by one group for 30 years and then they may sell it to up the deed restriction expired and then they uh, sold it off. Okay. Um, so asking counselors in general, if we received housing proposals, um, even if we keep the RFP open to other options, would we like to put a percentage of a specific housing type in? Councilor Bordelon? A uh, point of information first, I guess, because I'm a little confused after what he said and the more information. Is that a Your fair, question? The fair to talk about that if we don't have all the information yet? Well, I, I mean, I mean, to know that I've heard many people sit here tonight and say they would like to have a percentage of affordable housing and in, in housing if we get bids on those. So are you in generalized I guess uh, approval of that? Or do you want to have no restrictions and have no affordable housing requirements at all? I mean, I guess I'm really feeling locked in here, right? The options that are being proposed are what you feel is a consensus, and I'm, I'm told that respond, and it's going to be for all uh, school properties. I'm a huge, cons I've been speaking up here for four years. Many developments that we've had did not go affordable. I'm just asking, are you in but favor of our, I have, I have and that. I asked, what is your question? I'm getting there. If you could be a little bit more patient, please. I ask for that. Because you're asking us to make big decisions, and this I ask isn't for, okay a big decision you're what? not voting on anything we don't have all you the are answers. not talking specifics i it think it's general a big, to me it's a big deal we're talking about the livelihood of our community and our neighborhoods i didn't say it wasn't yeah. a big deal so a big i deal said you are not voting on it you are not making the decision it is a consensus Which and there's is, a big difference but then you say that but then it's used as the council's priorities and it's not fair because it's a consensus so my question when we say affordable in percent is that the only way we're accessing affordable housing or are we looking at mixed excuse me councilor jones is for asking a for a break okay perfect break. thank you thank you i agree
have a little drink and it's going to go straight to my head. Yeah. We're, we're, we're oh, we're recording. No, we're recording. <laughs> okay, we're back from recess. It's 9 11. Um, the item that we were trying to get a consensus from counselors is if we have any housing types, are we interested in potentially putting a percentage of a certain housing type into our RFP process? The specifics would be dealt when we discuss that certain each individual property. Councilor Bordelon. Um, I'm definitely a strong component and have been with all the properties prior to these of looking at affordable housing. Um, but I think it's beyond a percent is why I'm having trouble because there's ways in which we can have a sliding scale so it's affordable mid and upper all in one unit. So. That's a model that I'd like to see, and there's great examples out west. This is something I brought up three, four years ago. Um, so I think, yes, affordable housing, are you looking for a percent? No, I'm not looking just in general. Are you in favor of having per percents looked at? I think in general, and again, I just want to be clear that I'm not saying housing should be on all the properties, and when we're just doing this as a blanket thing for all of them, it's very confusing. So Thank that's you. it. Councilor Pacino? I am definitely in favor of having at least 10%. Uh, I don't want that to go down. Okay. Yeah, you know, We're so not discussing like the percentage, I'm, just in you. general. I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Councilor Russ? If there is housing, yes. Okay. Councilor Jones? Uh, yes. Councilor McBride? Yes. Well, Councilor Gajewski? I want to piggyback off my colleague, Councilor Bordelon's comment of a sliding scale. So it would be a certain percent of each one, so a sliding scale, which, so yes. Okay. I am also in favor of some type of discussion on a percentage with housing as well. And as I stated, specifics would be done when we hit each property. Um, does anybody else have something that besides percentage of housing, parks, um, and anything else? It, that we're opening the RFP to other things than just simply housing. Is there anything else somebody would like to throw out there that they think might fit a bunch of the properties? Council Bordelon. Um, so I was part of the council that agreed to look at uh, the land from in our town from a conservation you know, view, a lens. I think where we can leave mature trees and green bands, we should be putting that in there and trying. Also, when folks are coming in, you know, <laughs> I was just up in Maine and, you know, some of the parking lots in small developments, newer developments, all solar lights in their parking lots at the apartments and things. We can start asking for those things, asking for those things up front. So that way we're not asking after they come. Let's start asking now. So I would like to see more environmental um, ways of kind of, you know, being more carbon neutral and putting those in our RFP. If they come back to us and say they can't afford it, we can negotiate down later. But let's start putting that in our RFPs on the front end. So what I'm hearing is potentially environmental, environmental enhancements could potentially be graded higher than other proposals or bids that come in. Or it might be, because not everybody, you can't maybe not require it. I don't know, can we, what is your, so uh, those are that's all some really good feedback you know we i think in our draft rfps that we have right now there was something about preserving mature trees but i think we can put in there you know again our zoning regulations require like ev chargers now but we can talk about um lead certified buildings carbon neutrality in some of these developments um as well as you know solar lights more sustainable practices impervious uh, or sorry, pervious pavement and, you know, other items. We can look, if, if that's something that the council wants us to do a little bit of a dive into, I can ask um, Megan Granado to look at, you know, some, some practices as well as our uh, manager for inspection services. I know he's been dealing a lot with uh, Green Building Council and even our previous manager of inspection services that we still have a really good relationship with. He, I think, was on the National Code Council doing stuff on, like, more, say, green development. So if that's something the council wants us to include as options that people could put into their design, we certainly can. 
recognize the more things that we ask for, the, the less we will get in income. But if we want to show things as model development, that's, that's a, a great place to start. So that's something we certainly can do and let people know at a minimum that we're interested in those types of things. I, I think some of the language I saw said, if and when can things, you know, like there's vague language on there letting them know. Um, the other things is we, we just talked about mystic flooding, um, making sure that, you know, we can ask, can you guys plant things that are gonna help with runoff and rain, you know, these types of things. Also, what I read when I did a search, when I was impressed up in New Hampshire and Maine and other areas, they actually put the suggestions in their RFPs, but they also said it benefited developers because a lot of the developers had, um, there were resources when they used these things, they actually got financial money back. So there was incentives for developers to put the green carbon neutral stuff in place. So just like we are for our own homes, when you put in solar panels or you put in electric you know, heat blowers and things, there are rebates. There are rebates for those items for developers as well. So I just wanna see more of that as a thought to go forward. Thank you. All right, so let me, let me try and figure out how, so we can require it. We can say, um, we are interested in these if you can but if we get numerous different bids of different levels, or we could say you may grade higher if you can achieve some of these. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or we don't have to say anything at all. Or you can say, you know, we have a preference for, and we could list those types of things and, and, and give some general ideas. Again, this is, if, if everybody gives a general nod that, hey, we're interested in that, let us try and work it into the RFP and see if it works. And then so it could be then required, one, requested, or even looked upon more favorably. I would give, at this point, if you asked my recommendation, I think it would be guidance that it, it would be uh, preferred or looked upon favorably or some type of language like that. But whether we require it, I mean, from the stormwater perspective and, and runoff, we require that on our zoning regulations. We don't need to speak of that within the RFP. But things like, I mean, even EV chargers, we <coughs> require those in our zoning regulations. But things outside of that, um, if that's something that, if I get a general kind of head nod from everybody, we can work into it, that into the RFP. I mean, if you want to go through on a general consensus, um, give us a shot. So, Councilor Bordelon, you are obviously in favor of that, correct? Um, yep, so my first one would be looking at ways to save mature trees when we can. That would be one separate one. And my second one would be the carbon neutral incentives if, if and when they can. Madam and Mayor. Environmental I... enhancements, yeah. preferred, looked upon favorably. Right. They don't have to, but it would be great, you know, because there's... Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm Counselor on both, both of those. Yeah, that sounds great. Yes. 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 I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Preservation of certain pieces of the land and then environmental enhances, enhancements? Well, I think what Councilor Borderline was saying, and I don't want to speak for her, but she said mature trees okay. and environmental enhancements preferred looked upon favorably, but not required. Like it's not a requirement okay. to apply. And then the preservation, so preser it's preservation of trees, not- When they can. When they can, okay. Preferred, looked upon favorably. Yes to both. Thank you. Council Member Yeah, I'm in agreement with that, but I would just get back to, can we add, and I don't want to say, I don't know if it's preferred or whatever, but open space, parks, playground, and recreation areas, preserved wooden areas. I mean, can we list all those as not necessarily preferred, but we have an interest in them knowing that those, all those areas are important to us. Right, and when I think the part of the parks part was, when we talk about the specific properties in general we're in favor of parks so if we talked about one specific property that we think hey we, they could put a park on that property then maybe we specifically say we would like them to whoever bids that they're going to build a park there Under, understood but aren't we and maybe I, i'm only speaking for myself because i think we should be in favor of not just parks but open space playground recreation areas and preserving wooded areas all those components so couldn't we list all of those or is that too much? I think asking for all of that is a lot. Not that we're asking developer. for it, but we're saying these things are important to us. And in your submittal, 
include, as you may, information on those. <clears throat> I mean, we can we can take a stab at it. I think in the draft RFP that we had right now, we actually spoke about in generality. Gener generality. Sorry, talking too much tonight. It's late. <laughs> um, parks, recreation land, open space, trails. So I, I think a lot of that plays into it. And, but each each property is going to be a little bit different, Understood. and in each, I mean, we're not going to be talking about open space at Groton Heights. You know, it's, it's not really there. It, it's, it's a different site because just the constraint from the size of it. I guess my question is, we're coming up with these broad strokes, major themes. Aren't these others major themes as important to have on this boilerplate? Or it's already included? It sounds like it's already included. I, I, I think I already kind of got a good Okay, and you'll, on we'll pull out yeah. when the individual, when we review yeah. the individual RP, but at least it's a, <clears throat> it's, I guess what I'm saying it's not just parks and environmental. It's, there's, there's more to it than... In some of that, I think between now and when you see the next draft, you'll just have to trust in my my in my staff's uh, poetic um, mm -hmm. creativity in how we put this together. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. So you're okay with that? Yes. And then Councilor Geiske? Yes. Thank you. All right. I see that we have a consensus. Mm -hmm. So um, any other councilors have any? I just have a comment. Yes. So I don't know what I don't know. Is there something where we're, we've come up with a pretty good list of basic parameters? Is there something in here that you have done in other RFPs that we're missing and we just haven't, we just don't know to ask you to, to put it in here? No, I, I think this is pretty comprehensive. Um, I mean, around the region, <coughs> our, our, our RFPs were being used as the model. So um, okay. we were kind of already ahead of the curve on a lot of these things. I just want to make sure, because none of us are RFP property writers, that we just didn't miss something that's very obvious. You just didn't, you said, no, I'm not going to do that. As we go through this, um, it, you know, again, at the staff level, if something jumps out, um, I'm not shy. I'll bring it up. Okay. So right. if that's there's something I just want to make sure we're not, we didn't miss some big elephant in the room that we didn't think that we should have been putting in here. We yeah. Just didn't know it. So. so I think um, we're going to move forward and... The items, so if anybody here on the council would like to state anything that you need for documents or information, please send an email um, to Mr. Burt and request the items um, instead of we get to our next meeting and then we're asking for all these things that we, you know, so if anybody, if anything comes to mind, please ask for that. Um, and I thank you so much for this evening for coming out and having this big discussion with us and I'm glad the council could give you some kind of, you yeah direction to start with and um, we are going to because of the discussions I think we're going to not discuss 5c and 5d tonight we are going to um, move those to a future agenda do we have to make a motion to postpone them mr. Burr or shall we no we'll just put them on a future one Okay. Um, point of information. Your question? Do you need me to send an email about the what the percent of senior houses versus family housing is, or do you guys already have that? I got that written oh, down. All right. Thank you. Well, okay. well, no, you only asked for senior. I wasn't getting family. <laughs> well, I'm just, yeah, I'm just teasing. I'll get your family too. Well, it's 10 to 8, so if you tell me one, then it's August the other. Okay. So what we're going to I'll do the best I can based on available data. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. So we're going to pick up the agenda at 5E. And we're going to go to 2024-337, the Master Municipal Agreement Rights of Way Projects. That and is that, not mine. Good night, that's everybody. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Get to it. And that is... Okay. Um, on <clears throat> council, it's on our council packet, page 123. Right. And um, Councillor Pacino, would you like to move that one? All right. Motion to recommend. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Motion to recommend resolution authorizing the town manager, John Burt, to execute the agreement entitled Master Municipal Agreement for Rights of Way Projects. Second. Bordelon. All right. Moved by Pacino. Second by Bordelon. Okay. Um, I think you see. Uh, so I believe the cover letter was in there. Um, Years ago, there was a really real delays. And first of all, this covers projects and right-of-ways. 
in the past, every contract was done individually completely for every project and there was large delays in getting approval from the state. What the state did years ago is say, we're gonna take the base boilerplate, get that approved by the Attorney General, and that's what we're gonna use for now on. Then each individual project, it's a smaller review. We passed this last, same language, we passed this last in 2014, we can't change it. If we wanna get money or do work with state dollars, we have to approve this. Um, so there's really not much to it. And it has it, to be it, approved it, as it, is? Yes. And it's the same one from 14. Okay. Do you have any comments, questions, concerns, discussion? <clears throat> All right. I don't see any, so we will take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. So that passes seven to zero to zero. We are moving on. Page 161, which is 2024-322, BYOB ordinance update. Councilor Gajewski, would you like to carry that one? Can I have a page number? 161. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve, motion to set a public hearing to obtain public input on suggested change of the BYOB or ordinance. So moved. Second, borderline. Okay, moved by Gajewski, second by borderline. Okay, um, this was uh, it's a small update to the the uh, bring your own bottle ordinance. Uh, this was at the suggestion of the mayor, I believe, based on comments received. Um, all it do, the only proposed change is right now BYOB is prohibited from 12 a.m. to 10 a.m. The change would be uh, early two hours earlier, 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. So that's the only change in there. And the first step would have to be a public hearing. All right. We have any comments, questions? Council Portland? Um, so say that change one more time. Just so Currently it says 10, uh, 12 a.m. being midnight to 10 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. It would change from earlier by two hours from 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. We. We don't know if, we don't believe there's any current places operating outside, doing BYOB outside of those hours, but that would also be the purpose of the public uh, area. Right, and sure. on page 162, it shows the change made in the or, the ordinance that would, so, Council Borderline. So would this affect weddings, like, or any of those type of establishments? No. So if no. you rented the Brantford house and had a big wedding and that you have to hire, it's kind of a BYOB because you have to bring in alcohol because they don't have a bar there. So it covers uh, any business facility, such as a dance hall, club, restaurant, lounge, meeting room, meeting room or um, association not licensed by the Connecticut Liquor Control yeah. Division. I have a little concerns with that because I, I know I've been to some gatherings and they're pretty well regulated, but it's uh, people are still you know gathering until 11 o'clock at night. And I just don't want to restrict people's rights um, when they rent a space and they got the approval and the liquor license and everything like that, that they couldn't enjoy their wedding until, you know, they're gonna turn into a pumpkin at 10. They can't be out till 12 a.m. I don't know, I just a little worried about that. I could meet in the middle at 11, but I, I've been at weddings receptions that last beyond 10 p.m. And that's my only concern. So, are you finished? I'm sorry, I didn't wanna interrupt. No, you sorry. can speak. Good. All right, so, um, so this was my referral originally and recommendations changed. Um, without a liquor license, a business is not being overseen by the liquor commission. And this creates an issue when there is repeated issues um, at an at a establishment. Um, so a, the liquor commission can impose um, penalties, oversight, and potentially even closure of business if there's, it's very egregious. Um, as such, BYOB ordinances, um, I'm, it's suggested to be uh, set to 10 o'clock. In the ordinance, it does specifically say it is um, where people are allowed to bring their own alcoholic liquor to the facility and to consume thereon. Um, we had these discussions and in the past, and it was we went through every possible scenario we could possibly think of 
of every location in town and possibilities. And um, there was basically a couple of establishments that they, they close at 10. Um, if it's um, somebody that has a liquor license, it does not affect them because this was a BYOB, which means um, you have no license whatsoever. Um, it does not, um, it doesn't affect anybody that's under the liquor control already as well. So it does not, it does not affect your private residence because um, that was something that had come up. So um, it's basically certain businesses that are al allowing BYOB at their establishments and there are very few of them in town but to change it to 10 um, could potentially save some issues that could that arise that the liquor commission could be taking care of if they had a liquor license but things get out of control and um, they can't do anything about it so my question is how many businesses do we have that operate out that are BYOB outside of 10 p.m. We don't know of any right now. And from previous discussions, we, at this time, I, we couldn't, I can't think of any at this time. So I just, I mean, for me, I think it's kind of maybe not needed then. Well, um, there, <clears throat> in my, my opinion, if there's nothing really affecting it, then, uh, <clears throat> then why do we want to change something if it's, no one's really operating outside of those uh, times. I also am concerned, I know it states you can at private halls, but I've been, what if someone rents out a restaurant space and they say it's BYOB, BYOB for a wedding? Because you can rent like spaces, so your restaurant closes at you know a certain time or you buy it for the day and it's BYOB. And you're renting it from the business and it's a BYOB <clears throat> and they don't have a liquor license and it's always been a BYOB. Well, I think that's the point of the public hearing is to see if anybody comes forward saying, no, that's going to interrupt my business. Yeah, I, I think I think leaving it the way it is, I mean, have we had a lot of problems? I mean, we, we can't have had a lot of problems if we don't have any establishments, right? There's none that operate past 10 p.m. So, we, I mean, we don't have a problem. Then. So I think I just am concerned we could restrict. I just think of weddings and things like that, retirement parties or any other type of things where they're renting a a building a structure that is already an established uh, business is my concern so I would I'm not going to be in favor of changing it because if there's nothing that operates outside of that and we're not sure um, how that would affect uh, the other, I, I think leaving it the way it is for now is fine for me um, just to clarify, it's not so much to for what's here now. It's for the potential of what could end up coming into our community, and do we want the this type of establishments that are allowing BYOB till 4 a.m. in the morning? And um, that's a question that we, as a council, can decide um, if we want establishments that are going to be here till 4 in the morning without any allowing liquor consumption without. Um, without any kind of oversight from the Liquor Commission. So I would so. be in favor of stopping it, um, maybe, it, but I would like it to stop at least at 12 midnight. I don't think it should go until four in the morning. That's what it was. Right, but we could change the time then, so. It, it currently is at 12 midnight and we're changing it down to 10. Right, but you said till four in the morning. I'm saying a, an, a business could potentially stay open until four in the morning, yes. Under the current rule, uh, under the current. It has nothing to do with the BYOB, but they could be open till four in the morning and serving alcohol. Yeah, till midnight and unregulated and with other issues that could potentially come with that. Yeah, I just don't want it to have a negative effect on other type of ceremonies and things, that's all. Okay. Uh, but not till four in the morning, I don't agree. I, don't, I think it should stop at midnight. <coughs> Are you all set? I think that's it, yeah. Thank you. Councilor Bracino? I, I am for this uh, for the reason, thank you, Madam Mayor, by sure. the way. I am for this for, the, for one reason is that if, if we don't change it to 10 p.m. and then a business comes in and wants to do something, 
then we want to change it. Now we're picking on them. Um, this way here, they know this is the rule when you open up your business, and, and uh, we don't have to deal with that. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, Councillor Gasky? Um, I have I, I have similar concerns um, with my colleague, Councillor Bordelon. Um, my question is: Is it possible to um, do the 10 p.m. on like? certain days of the week and then it make it midnight um, mm -hmm. on Fridays or Saturdays? You can make it whatever you want it to be. And this, that we're not, this isn't motioning to change the ordinance correct right now. We're just motioning for a public hearing on it and then we would have a vote on correct. the ordinance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Um, Yes, just reading the motion, this is a motion for a public hearing. So I'm in favor of a public hearing, and we can get the feedback from the public hearing and make any changes from that point on. So mm -hmm. I'm just, it's a public hearing motion, not a changing the time motion. Point of information? Your question? Mm -hmm. But we're putting forward a time as a suggestion for a public hearing. Is that correct, then? Or else we would, <clears throat> there should be no time here if we're not making a suggestion. The way this reads is we're giving the public a suggestion. Is that correct? So we are talking about the time. <clears throat> just trying to understand. Because if we weren't, it would just say we're looking for open discussion on changing it to an earlier time, period. But this says the town council will discuss whether to update. So we do need to talk about that because it says the council will choose to update. So I'm confused. Councilor Gajewski, did you make, when you made your motion, did you set a date? I did not set a date. You would, what I, was exactly your motion then? I think you made a motion. Um, I made a motion to for the town um, um, to set a public hearing to obtain public input on the suggested BYOB ordinance change. We could do it on May 7th, the same night as the other one. Okay. So do you need me to add a date to it? I don't know. Is a date required in the motion? Oh. Um. I can always just add it in the resolution. You have to pass the resolution anyways. Right. Okay. Councillor um, McBride. Thanks. I'm, I'm okay with having a public hearing because I think it's always good to hear what the public have to say about something like this. But I, I don't know if I'm in favor of this overall plan because I don't understand the reason right off the bat. It doesn't seem like to be an issue as far as I'm aware of. So I don't recognize that there's a problem, but I also have a couple of other questions. How, do, how is this being regulated? Like the change from 10 to 12, how does that change our regulation procedures? Or does it? Well, when we, if we hear of a complaint, then obviously we, it's through the police department. So it would increase more activity in the police because you're going to be watching somebody at 10, 15 serving alcohol. Well, if we set the rule up front, the hope is that you would head that off. Okay, but it could increase more police activity, I would think, if you're limiting hours. But another question. Um, this is not for the city, not for Noak, or not for Route Long Point? Correct. Okay, which leads me to the Hold business it. concerns. Because I think we're playing favoritism because you do have someone like a Hold Ford's it. Let officer. me rethink that. It's not for GLP and it's not for the city. It would be for Noak. Noak only has their own zoning. Okay, so then we have a Ordinances do apply in Noak. Okay, and I know there's someone that's going to be affected because there's articles in the paper about the Ford's Lobster. It is BYOB currently. And they close at 10. They do? That may change with the new owner, though. I'm just, there could be, but anyway. So I think, I, I feel like we're playing favoritism on a business matter. And we're limiting of future restaurants coming into town. But aren't we trying to increase economic development? <clears throat> this may hinder a restaurant from being a BYOB and, and being a business owner. It's hard to make any profit. So some places are moving more towards BYOB because of the liquor liability and things associated with that. So I think we're, I, I don't know, I think I'd be overstepping my bounds voting on something like this um i also think we should potentially think about sending this to the edc for review because i think it's definitely going to have um, economic development impacts so i'm not i'm, I'm okay with having a, a public hearing just to get people's thoughts but i don't know if in, unless i hear more reasons why we need to do this i wouldn't support it as of right now because i don't i don't see the reason but 
that's just my thoughts, but I'm okay with the public here. Thank you. Well, I will say that there has been a BYOB establishment that um, we have gotten many updates on. They are no longer in business at this time. And uh, the police responded to them consistently, regularly, with very major crime concerns there. And they had no help from the Liquor Commission to be able to stop the establishment that on normal situations, the Liquor Commission could have stepped in and helped greatly, but that wasn't their business model. So their business model was to be a BYOB late in the evening. And that's why this came, um, there is potential for that to come back into our community. Not that there is anything at this moment, but there are talks around local communities for that type of establishment to come back. And um, so we as a council can choose, and I will tell you from my perspective, I heard from an overwhelming, a, a lot of people in our community who did, do not want that kind of establishment in our, our community. So this is a tool and the police, when this first came forward, were in favor of it. And um, council sort of went to a higher later number that maybe wasn't so helpful later in the evening. No, I understand that. And I, I understand when, the, the place you're talking about, too. So and I when I did my research on this, um, there were like maybe three businesses in the community, and they do close at 10 o'clock. So that's from my research. Councilor Rusk. Or, I'm sorry, Mr. Councilor McBride, are you all set? Councilor Rusk. Um, so I, I'm very much like Councilor McBride. I'm very much in support of doing a public hearing, um, but I'm, I'm hesitant to move forward. But I would love to hear from the police as well on their take on this. Um, and I would love to get some feedback from economic development as well on what their thoughts are on this. Um, I just don't want to stifle individual rights. I don't want to hinder economic development, but I also want to support our police if there is an issue. So um, that's kind of where I stand, but I would be happy to move forward with the public hearing. Okay, thanks. And get more information in the meantime. Thank you. Could, Council could, Sorry. Yeah, so I don't think it's also fair or germane, in my opinion, um, and I'm not saying we are, I'm just simply saying we, we subcategory one business that was a problem and say, we're worried about the others. I could have a BYOB establishment on a, on a river and do late night movies at a campground and it's BYOB and it could be very successful and fine and never have a problem. What we experience, I don't know, could be indicative to an individual or individuals running a particular business. But as a whole, it doesn't mean that every person that has a BYOB that decides to have something after 10 o'clock is going to be a problem because that would not be fair to say. I happen to be away and um, was up north and they had this awesome bonfire after hours. They had uh, the food trucks, the restaurant shut down. It was on the property, it was BYOB. They had big bonfires going. I went up the road to the local winery. We bought a bottle of wine and we did sit by that fire till probably about 11.30 at night. And there was about 40 or 50 people there they had a movie projecting, it was the pre-eclipse party, they did, you know, that type of stuff. Very successful, nobody was rowdy, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, I can agree that some could get out of hand, but that's like saying, I'm gonna treat this, my, for me, it's like saying, I'm gonna treat my one son one way and one the other. Two different kids, two different responsibilities, two different personalities, two different forms of leadership, two different ways of interpreting the world, and you do parent them differently. You love them the same, you parent them differently. So I just don't want it to be, if there was one business, that it categorizes all of them for our community. Because there are some very successful after hour establishments that are family oriented and a lot of fun, and I've done them in many states, um, where you can bring a bottle of wine and sit by a fire at an establishment that has an activity going on, let it be music, dancing, concerts. Um, there is a push for that. Uh, with more open space and parks, a lot of places do, you know, fires and live music and you can bring a bottle of wine. They do limit it to a bottle of wine. They don't say hard alcohol or other things, but I, don't know, I just worry that we, we're kind of 
we had a bad taste with something it's creating. Up until that point, I haven't heard any problems until that one particular establishment. So I just don't want it to change our whole thing. Um, and it could have some economic development impacts um, down the road. Um, so I'm all for a public hearing, but again, I'm afraid of restricting something based on one establishment. Um, so thank you. Mayor. Um, I would, you know, thinking about the EDC input, if that is the desire, I would say we should probably shoot for the June timeframe so the EDC has time to review. What date are you suggesting? Uh, one sec here. June 4th. All right, so do we want to, um, let's take a consensus. Do we want to have a referral going over to the Economic Development Committee? Councilor uh, Bordelon. For a public hearing? This is to go to EDC as a referral to review. Oh, absolutely. I think it would be great to get, um, yeah. Uh, Pacino? Yes. Rusk? Yes. Jones? Yes. <clears throat> McBride? Yes. Gajewski? Yes. All right. So we have seven in favor of going as a referral over to EDC. And um, we have a motion on the floor for a public hearing to obtain public input on the suggested change. Um, and Town Manager Burt has suggested June 4th. So we will be moving that. Um, is there any further discussion? All right. Motion All those adjourn. in favor? Oh, sorry. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? McBride abstains. All right. That passes six to zero to one. Motion to adjourn? All right. Second. So moved by Borderline. Seconded by Gajewski. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, opposed? Abstentions. That passes seven to zero to zero. Mm.